All right, so today is Monday, June 14th. Um, so we've been talking about HTML and we've been talking about CSS. Um, I don't know if you guys have had experience with uh, developing web pages. Um, you know, in the 90s when the internet was up and about, I think um, some of us or, you know, uh, maybe many of us kind of dabbled just creating basic HTML pages. Um, but from what the 90s offered to what we can do today, uh, it's, it's uh, night and day in terms of capabilities of um, development. So let's uh, kind of learn the basics. Um, again, some of, we, some of us may have never used HTML before. So the goal of today is to make sure we understand what HTML is, how we write HTML documents. Likewise for CSS, what do we use that for and how do we actually employ it on our web pages? All right, let's dive into the lecture today then. All right, so front end web development. So we're kind of switching gears um, in terms of um, our focus. If we if I can kind of pull up, pull up the page from our curriculum. So we have this uh, you know, uh, image down here. So our first three weeks, we kind of spent on OOP Python. Um, we also touched upon JavaScript. So you know, week one, we, we definitely were doing some JavaScript basics. Now we're diving into HTML, CSS, and we're going to combine that with JavaScript. So we're taking care of this chunk. Um, just looking ahead, week five is going to be dealing with SQL. And then week six is going to introduce Django. So we're going to take off, you know, this chunk of the diagram um, over the next few weeks. All right, but again, this week's focus is going to be HTML, CSS, and employing JavaScript um, eventually. All right, let's get to our lecture. So um, HTML, CSS, JavaScript, that's our focus this week. Tying them all together, we'll see how they kind of work together, what um, each kind of does for us. So this kind of breaks this down into an analogy. This isn't going to be the perfect analogy, but I think um, might make um, some sense into what these languages or technologies are used for. So first we have HTML. Um, does anyone have a maybe a good description of what HTML is actually um, doing for us? Uh, yeah, it's pretty much just like the format of the uh, the web page. So it's going to be very like vanilla looking, but you're just going to have words or bullets um, on your web page. Absolutely, Reno uh, nailed it right on the head. Um, so HTML gives us our structure or the format um, that we're going to be working with. Um, so then in this analogy, um, I'm going to describe that as the, like the bare bones. Just again, the, when you think about structure, you think about like the foundation. So if you imagine just like a skeleton, right? So we, you know, our bodies have bones in them. Um, they kind of just de uh, define how we look and like what we build on top of. So that's what HTML in this analogy will be. Next, we have not really a technology, but part of, part of the equation, we have our web browser. So in this case, once we have our structure, which is you know, our bones, um, we need to render um, the structure so that we could actually display it in a meaningful format. So in this case, that's where the body comes into play. So like we add the skin on top, like organs kind of get inserted. So the browser takes the structure and actually provides like a, a visual um, display of it. Um, so that's kind of just wrapping the structure with something more, um, more pleasing, I guess. All right, so that's what the body is, um, just the basic, um, you know, taking the structure and displaying it up, outward. Then we have CSS. So, this, you know, you can develop a web page and kind of just have like a naked body, and that's totally fine. Like it's, it, it's kind of what the main purpose is of, the, of uh, writing an HTML document. But again, that's not going to be usually the most pleasing. So that's where, CSS comes out and kind of updates your look and layout. So you're not just dealing with like a quote unquote naked uh, page, you actually have some style. So this is where I'd say like clothes would be the, in this analogy. Um, any Archer fans out there? Um, hopefully you guys, uh, I, I haven't been, I don't, I'm not a huge Archer fan, but definitely appreciate the humor um, from the episodes I've seen. All right, so that's CSS. Again, look and layout for your web page. Then finally, we have JavaScript. So these three elements um, working together, you can create, you know, a great web page, but it's going to be kind of dumb in the sense that your web page can't do much. It renders stuff and you know gives your user and your, your end user something to look at. But JavaScript is where you actually create the logic. So if you want your page to be smart, as in to actually do like more complicated stuff rather than just clicking on buttons, that's where JavaScript can be play, and that's your brain of your web application. All right, so again, structure is given by HTML. Your style is given by CSS. Um, 
your logic, like your core functionality, your actual programming is in JavaScript. HTML is not a programming language per se. It is a markup language. It's basically, again, just giving you a structure. It's not really making decisions. You're not writing if statements or for loops in HTML. That is, that is what JavaScript is for. And then all three of these, again, the browser will kind of handle all three of these um, and kind of present your web page. All right, so it's just a simple analogy, not the perfect analogy. I'm sure you can find loopholes or break down this analogy, but that's kind of just how I envision it. You have your brain, you have your structure, and then you have your style. All right, so let's talk about HTML. What does HTML actually stand for? It stands for Hypertext Markup Language. So that's how you get your HTML. What is HTML used for? So um, a lot of us are probably familiar with it, probably have heard of HTML. Um, HTML is used to create web pages. Uh, and more specifically, to define the structure as we kind of talked about. Um, so another al analogy, kind of switching gears, um, if we're just thinking about HTML versus CSS, HTML is going to be your, um, if you're like building a house, it's going to be the structure or the foundation of your house. Again, so the walls, the floors, ceilings, stairs, every, just every core part of your house that gives it structure, that's what HTML is actually doing. And as we talked about web browsers, whether it be Chrome, Firefox, Safari, whatever you use, is going to take that HTML document that you create or that anyone's created and actually parse it out. So it will take a document and make it um, actually functional and visual. Um, that's the job of a web browser. Okay, so we're going to go over some terminology. Um, again, uh, not always the fun, funnest thing to do to learn terminology, but you got to speak the language. So let's make sure we understand uh, what what we mean when we say specific things within HTML. So the first thing is HTML document. A document consists of HTML elements, all right? And then often you're gonna see these as nested elements and we're gonna see examples of this. Um, but then basically a document is just a bunch of elements um, put onto the page. An element can be further broken down into a tag and then usually has some content, all right? So we're just kind of highlighting these words, make sure you kind of um, pick up those words when we're talking about them. So when someone says tag versus element, you should be able to kind of know what they mean. Um, tag and element are very similar, sometimes interchangeable, but there's a difference. So an element is a tag with content together. A tag consists of a tag name and may have uh, various attributes. So when we talk about attributes, kind of just like properties of the tag that give it more, um, you know, more definition. And then the attribute can be broken down into name value pairs. So again, if you kind of just think it top down, HTML is a collection of elements. Elements are tags and content. A tag is, at, uh, is a name and attributes, and then attributes are name value pairs. So many, many different uh, layers to this. So let's actually see an example, because again, just hearing about definitions, not gonna really do it justice, uh, not gonna make much sense. So let's, let's take a look at um, an element, or basically an example, um, elements. So here, the format you'll see, um, let's just break it down. You have angle brackets. So you always use an uh, opening angle bracket or the, you know, I guess less than sign um, to open an element. And then you give it a tag name. These tag names are pre-reserved as in there's a whole list of them. Um, so you get kind of got to know which, which tag you need to use to accomplish your task. And that's, again, it requires a lot of memorization. So the good and bad of HTML is that you don't have to use that much brain power in the sense of you know how to solve specific problems, but you get, you do have to use brain power in terms of memorizing a whole list of tags. There's probably over a hundred tags in HTML. The good thing is you're not usually using all hundred of them. I'd say probably you can boil it down to ten common ones, or or maybe even fewer. But um, you just got to know the tag names, or that's where documentation comes into play. So you give it a tag name, and then you may have attributes. Attributes. The format is just going to be attribute name. You have an equal sign, and then usually in strings um, or quotation marks, you'll have the actual value. And you could have multiple attributes, just depends on the tag. These attributes generally are specific to the tag. So certain tags have very specialized attributes. Other, um, you know, other tags might kind of use the same attributes um, that other tags use. It's, um, it'll kind of just make sense when you read documentation. In between your tags, you'll have, you'll usually have content. So that's where the content goes here. And then you need to close your tag. So closing tags are um, angle brackets, but you have this slash here. So let's kind of look at our example. Um, down here, I'm using an A tag, also known as an anchor tag. 
Uh, this is how you create links in a web page. So, um, yeah, so in this case, uh, this entire thing is called an element. So having a tag, attributes, some content, and a closing tag, this entire thing is one element. As we, as we mentioned before, an element can be broken down into a few, uh, few pieces. So breaking this down a bit more, we have an opening tag. An opening tag is everything between um, the opening caret or angle bracket and the closing angle bracket. All right, so this is the first, this is the opening tag. Um, again, there's a name, attributes, but the angle brackets oh, kind of uh, delineate the tag here. So this is where the tag begins, this is where the tag ends. Then we have a closing tag. So pretty much for every tag that you open, you need a closing tag. And the way you close the tag is simply you have a forward slash and the name of the tag that you open. So in this case, I opened an A tag. So my closing tag is going to be angle brackets. And inside of that, I'm going to have a slash and the name of the tag. In this case, it was just A. Um, for this example, I have these spaces kind of uh, coded in here or typed out here. Usually, you're not going to see these spaces. It's not going to hurt. Um, you're, like, the browser is still going to be able to parse it. But usually, you're not going to have spaces between the opening angle bracket and then the name. I just did that for visual purposes here. And then in between an opening tag and a closing tag, you'll usually have some content. So in this case, um, what this is doing is creating a link because that's what the anchor tag does. Um, Code Platoon website is going to be the clickable link, like the user, what the user sees. And then the href, in this case, an href is a special attribute. That's the target of the link. So when they click on Code Platoon website, they should be taken to http www.codeplatoon.org. Questions on the format or the syntax you're using? All right, let's proceed then. All right, so we can further break down tags into more, you know, more granular, granular units. So here we have a tag. Um, as mentioned, we, get, we always start with the tag name. So you have your angle brackets, always start with the tag name. That's what defines what's going to come in this tag. So in this case, the tag name is A, um, or, you know, that's known as the anchor tag, but it's just used as an A. And then um, a lot of tags can have attributes. So this entire thing is an attribute. But this attribute can be broken down into name value pairs, as mentioned. So we have an attribute name. In this case, href is our attribute name. And then our attribute value is um, the website location we're given here. So notice we're in quotes. Again, for the most part, you're always going to see quotes as your values. So together, this makes an entire attribute. Attribute name equals attribute value. All right, so um, any questions on the syntax? Again, just make sure we understand the difference between elements, a tag, attributes, content. These are all parts of a HTML element. Okay. All right, hopefully we're good with the syntax. Again, we're gonna see many examples of this, but just get familiar with how you open a tag, um, how do you had to close a tag, what, where the content goes. Again, the syntax with angle brackets, the syntax with attributes should all be familiar to you by the end of today. I mean, with more practice, uh, it should be familiar to you. OK, let's talk about some types of elements you can have. So um, okay. elements in HTML are usually broken down into two buckets. Um, you have block level elements and inline elements. And this all has to do with how these elements are displayed by browsers. Again, each browser that is rendering your HTML could do things a little differently. Um, so like Safari versus Chrome might, you know, use these elements differently. Basically, we're feeding it the language, the browser is deciding on how to render it. Most browsers should be consistent. Uh, you don't want, you know, like Safari, something in Safari looking completely different than in Chrome or in Firefox. Um, but there, are, there might be subtle differences um, between the browsers, how they render certain things. So that, that can be part of the headaches of being a web developer. You got to make sure that you cover your bases with like all major browsers. So, you know, Android um, browsers, Chrome, Firefox, Safari, Opera. I'm not sure what other popular browsers are there, but you got to make sure that whatever you're developing works on all of those. Um, usually, it should like be the same, but sometimes you're going to run into corner cases where that's not true. So block level elements 
these are elements that take the entire horizontal space um, or basically the entire line that they're on. So if we create a P tag, also known as a paragraph tag um, or um, H1, header one or a div, um, these will again, take up the entire horizontal space. Inline elements are a bit different. So inline elements can basically share horizontal space. So you can kind of nest them um, together in the same line. So common examples of uh, inline elements are the anchor tag, which we kind of talked about earlier. There's also a strong tag, span tag. Again, as I mentioned, HTML has you know over a hundred different tags. So don't worry if you are kind of intimidated by that. Um, there's many many tags you're never never going to see probably. Um, there's very there's a, again a handful of common tags that are going to be used often. So you should get familiar with those. And we'll talk about the common ones um, in a few slides. All right. So again, just block level elements take up the entire horizontal space. Inline elements can be you know, can share horizontal space. That's the main difference between these two buckets. All right, um, there's also two other um, buckets you can divide HTML elements into. You have non-empty elements, and then you have empty elements. Um, most elements are non-empty, which means they have content. So if we go back to our example, um, content. So the content sits between the opening tag and the closing tag. Most tags or most elements will have content, but not all um, elements will have content. It depends on which tag you're using. So uh, go back. All right, so paragraphs, anchor tag, list tags, these have content. So there's gonna be some text between the opening and closing tag. Empty elements, on the other hand, don't have any content, but they still may display something. So that's something important to keep in mind. So there's no actual, text between the tags, but they still might render something, like the browser still might render something based on the tag. So the best example of that is the image tag. So the image tag does not actually have any content. You don't specify any like textual content between um, like the opening and closing image tag, but there's gonna be like usually an image displayed. Um, the break line or horizontal rule tags also, um, they don't have any content. They still affect uh, what's shown, but there's no, textual content that you add in. So empty tags should be self-closing. So here's an example of an image tag. In this case, um, again, opening angle bracket, IMG is the tag for images. SRC is an attribute that you usually always will specify with uh, image tags because that specifies what you actually wanna show. So in this case, I have, um, I'm trying to show donuts.png, so it's probably an image of donuts. And then the key thing here at the very end, this tag is both an opening tag and a closing tag. Because I have this slash, this forward slash, and then the ankle bracket. This is closing this tag. So if, if I go back to my example, in most cases, you need a separate closing tag for, um, for elements that have content. But for those tags that don't use, um, don't use content, you want to close them in the same tag that you're opening. You guys with me? Take that as a yes. A uh, quick question. Yeah. What was the HR one? Use again? I can't remember. Sure. Yeah, again, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Half the battle is just kind of memorizing what these do. So don't, don't worry if you're kind of lost on what these are. We will talk about these. Um, pretty much every tag I've shown here, we will talk about. Um, but HR is a horizontal rule. So great question. Um, horizontal rule is basically add a dividing line on your web page. So when we code up an example, we'll try to make sure we use all these tags, but basically it just creates a divider if you want to simplify it on your page between sections. Um, BR breaks your line. So that's the same thing as like a new line character um, in like, you know, when we're coding, we have a slash N, that's a new line. In HTML, we use the break line um, tag to create a new line. Gotcha. Yep. But again, yeah, uh, there's a whole list of them. Um, don't worry, if, again, if you're kind of lost, and, like never, you, like you don't know how to use an anchor tag or don't know what a list tag kind of formats like, we'll, we'll, we'll make sure we cover the, the main common one. All right, so let's actually start talking about how we create an HTML document. So these are common required tags. Um, HTML is how you actually start and end your document. So HTML is like your parents element for all other elements on your HTML page. So you open an HTML um, tag, you put all your contents inside of it, 
and then you close your HTML tag and that defines your entire HTML document. Your HTML um, doc document will usually have two, two main sections, your head section and your body section, All right? Your head will contain your metadata. So when we talk about metadata, that could be various things like, you know, style, style sheets, could be um, JavaScript logic, could just be like um, search engine optimization results, just having some meta tags in there. Um, a lot of content can go into the head um, tag, but it's nothing that your user will see, as in whoever's going to your web page, they're not going to see anything that's in your head, um, in your head section. I guess the one slight exception might be the title. So the title goes inside of your head section, and this is what's shown at like the very top of your web browser. So if I go to one of my open web browsers, so I have um, this is the web page. Everything you see here on um, this, this is all in the body section, right? So everything I'm highlighting here or trying to highlight, this is all in the body, everything where my mouse is going. The only thing, um, the title up here, this is coming from the head section. So there's a title tag and Oscar slash curriculum would be the title of this page. So the body is down here, the title is shown up here. And so the title does go in your head section, and we'll see um, that when we create our first web page. Uh, again, the title isn't required. So I know I have common required tags here. The title isn't required. You can leave off the title tag and it should be fine. But usually you want to give your page a title. Like you don't want to just have unnamed tabs out there. Um, the real interesting part, or the real part that we usually care about, is the body. The body is everything that your end user will see. That is what actually gives your web page, you know, display or what your browser can display um, by searching the body tag and looking at the elements in there. All right. So just be familiar with these. Um, the main two sections are head and body. HTML is just your main parent element, and then title is just a common one you will see um, in your head section. All right. Let's talk about some common tags. And again, don't worry, we're going to use these in an example. So um, again, we're just trying to get all the you know technical um, boring stuff out of the way, but common tags that you will see. So I would say, again, the tags I've listed here are probably, I'm making up a number here, but I'm going to say probably like 90% of the tags you're going to be using are going to be these tags listed here. So there's not, you know, as I said, there's over 100 HTML tags, but here you probably have like 10, uh, maybe a dozen tags you got to worry about. Um, so let's kind of talk about uh, the types of tags we might have. So we have headers. Headers, there are six different types of headers. Header one, two, three, four, five, and six. These aren't too complicated to understand. They're just, um, you use headers to kind of, um, I guess, give, give emphasis to titles. So when you're probably creating a title for your, your web page, probably want to use the H1 tag. That's going to be the largest and boldest font um, for whatever title you're presenting. H2 is just a smaller, slightly smaller font size than H1. H3 is smaller than H2 and so forth. So H6 is actually your smallest heading, which might be kind of deceptive because it's the highest number, but H1 is your largest and most prominent heading that you should use. Versus H6 will be like for subsections. Um, H2, H3 might be for just like smaller sections on your page. Um, but again, that's just however you want to use them. But H1 is probably the most common because it's uh, the most prominent. But if you want to have granularity, use H2, H3, H4, as you wish. Again, this is just for kind of like titles on your web page to make them stand out. <clears throat> Most textual content will go inside paragraph tags. So the short, uh, the name of paragraph tags, it's just P. Again, kind of simpler to type off than typing out paragraph. Um, the tag is just the tag of P. So you'll open a paragraph tag, you'll add your text in between, and then you'll close your paragraph tag for that um, section of text on your web page. So you have paragraph tags for text. When you want to create a link, use that anchor tag that we kind of mentioned before. And the anchor tag is just the letter A. So pretty simple to um, include. Again, all of these, not all of these, but a lot of these tags do have attributes that you can include in them. Um, so a lot of that's going you know, to boil down to reading documentation about which tags can take which attributes. Um, the A tag, as I mentioned, has an href tag uh, attribute, and that specifies where the link will actually go. All right, so you create links with anchor tags, images, IMG, kind of short form for image. Um, that's how you usually display images on your web page. I think that's pretty 
pretty uh, easy to guess there. Uh, again, the image tag uses SRC attribute to, to specify which um, data file you actually want to use as your image. And then we have all, can also have lists on our page. So, you know, textual content goes in paragraphs, but if you want to actually have, you know, list content, you can create two, uh, two types of lists. There's OL and UL. OL stands for ordered list. So if you want to create like a, you know, like a top 10 list, um, you'd use an order list that gives you numbers. So the first bullet would be one, second would be two, and so forth. That's what OL gives you. UL gives you unordered lists. So if you don't have any you know, specific ordering to your list, you just want to list like five different destinations you've been to, um, then you might, you'll use an unordered list, which is just bullet points. There's no numbering to them. LI stands for a list element. These are going to be nested. When I say nested, so um, I just mean, uh, if we're familiar with like nested for loops, maybe that's not the best example, basically kind of embedded within um, these other tags. So list elements, will be um, underneath unordered list or ordered list. So they're like kind of the children of the parent list. The list, these two define a list object and the list elements um, define uh, like the actual items in there. So LI central list items. Um, spacing, uh, we kind of mentioned these earlier also, but BR stands for break line. This just creates a new line on your document. And HR stands for horizontal rule. That just creates like a vertical line for kind of dividing up sections. And then you can create, um, these are kind of like, I don't know what the best way to say them. These are invisible tags as in div and span. They don't really give you anything aside from just creating sections within your page that you can kind of divide up for purposes. Like these are really useful with CSS um, to, to add divs and spans so that you can kind of target specific parts of your page and give them um, styling or whatever functionality you need to. All right, so div, um, I believe stands for division and span, it's just a span. Um, these two create, again, subsections within your page. Your end user, like if you have like, you know, a bunch of div tags, your, the browser is not gonna actually show anything different. Um, that just gives you more specific sections to kind of control. Um, same thing with span. Span, um, if you remember from our previous slides, these two are effectively the same thing. The only main difference is that divs are block elements, as in they take up the entire horizontal space. Spans, on the other hand, can be inline. Or I mean, sorry, they are inline. Otherwise, they both kind of are the same thing. OK, so throwing a lot of uh, tags at you, a lot of terminology. Um, I think the best thing to do would be actually kind of apply everything we kind of talked about and then kind of highlight them with examples. So let's actually create our first web page in HTML. Um, I think this might be a good time if you guys want to code along. Um, you know, we're not going to do too, anything too crazy. So if you guys want to code along, feel free to. I think um, we should be able to do that together. So I'm going to go to my VS Code, which I have open somewhere here. There's my VS Code. Uh, I'm going to create an HTML document. So to create our HTML file, I'm going to create a new file. And I'm going to call it index.html. Um, index is usually a traditional name for like your main page. So you will see that often. Uh, I'm not sure the origins of that, um, but index.html, again, will usually be your main page. You can name it whatever you want, though. Uh, the key thing is you need a .html um, file type. So if I want to create another HTML document, I could say hello.html, and that's also an HTML document. If you have, you know, VS icons, uh, VS Code icons installed, you will see that your icon should change to like this shield that has a five in it. That's the HTML logo that they use. But yeah, let's actually, I had a typo here. Apologies there. Rename. All right, so I'm going to go to my index.html and let's create our first document. Um, who remembers how I need, how I, how I can start an HTML document? HTML uh, type. Uh, yep, that, that's true. I guess I haven't talked about doc type. Um, so there's a doc type that actually specifies um, what type of document it is. So in this case, um, this isn't required. It is highly recommended that you have this. Your HTML document will still work without this. What you will see is often. This kind of just gives um, the browser, whoever's parsing this, um, some knowledge of what type of document it's trying to parse. All right, so we can include the doc type. You will see that pretty much all the time. Um, but it is not 
is not fully required in terms of having HTML um, document rendered. Uh, what is the tag I need to use to actually start my HTML document? HTML. Yep, simple enough to remember. If I want to start an HTML document, I use HTML. All right, so VS Code um, and a lot of um, IDEs or editors will kind of create your closing tag for you, so it's kind of just handy. Um, I didn't type this out, so when I close my HTML opening tag, so this is my opening HTML tag. When I hit that bracket, it automatically created a closing tag for me. So that's kind of nice, um, but don't just be wary of that. As in, if you're just using a text editor, it's not going to automatically happen for you. So you always need a closing tag for anything you open. All right. So in this case, my opening tag is here. My closing tag is here. And this is my HTML document. What I have here constitutes a full HTML document because I have my HTML element here. But there's no content here. So there's nothing in between my opening and closing tag. So this is not going to be very interesting if I pull it up in a web browser. All right, so let's actually add some more parts. And I'm going to create like the most basic structure and then we'll add on to it. So as I mentioned, there are two main sections to an HTML page. Does anyone remember offhand? You got the head body. And the body. Yep. I think I heard both pieces. We have the head section. So again, my closing tag automatically got created. And then we also have the body. Um, one thing I did not mention, I don't, don't think I have this in my slides, you can add comments in your HTML documents. Um, you know, I would say they're a little different than adding comments in your coding solutions that we've done in the past because usually algorithms are not easy to understand. So it's good to have comments to say, hey, this section of code is actually computing X, Y, and Z. In HTML documents, you really don't need comments to guide your user. These tags are pretty self-explanatory, but you can add comments if you want to. So the way you add a comment is you do an opening angle bracket, exclamation mark, and then two dashes. Kind of an odd syntax there, but once you have two dashes, this starts your comment, and then your comment will end with two dashes and a closing um, angle bracket. In this case, you don't need to close it. You don't need to close this tag like we do with um, these other tags here. Like you don't need a separate um, closing tag, whatever it might be. So this isn't really a tag, it's just the syntax for a comment. So again, you do not need to close your comment. The way you actually close your comment is with this right here. It kind of looks like an arrow, it's two dashes and an angle bracket to close it. Anything I type in here is gonna be a comment. The browser's gonna ignore it. But let's actually put some comments to make sure we know what we're doing. So this <coughs> section contains metadata. The metadata is just stuff that can be used by your browser, but it's not going to be displayed by your browser. So again, I mentioned like search engine optimization. You might see a lot of meta tags, meta, and then I actually don't know all my meta tags, but um, a lot of these tags are used by like a search engine. As again, if you're familiar with Google, they have like web crawlers that go basically across the web and try to fetch all these meta tags so they know what your page is about. Um, so if this page were about like donuts, I'd probably have a meta tag that specifies this is about donuts. Um, forget how, again, I, I'm not too clear on meta tags. So I'm not gonna pretend I know about them, but um, you can just can include data in your head section for other purposes other than display. Um, the main common one uh, tag you'll see in here is the title. As I mentioned, this actually gives your page a title. So let's just say this, let's call this my first HTML page. One thing to mention before I forget, case does not really matter in HTML. I can create an HTML tag like this, cap, use all caps, that's gonna mean the same thing. So in this case, it's it's not gonna matter. Usually I use lowercase, I'm not sure why. Um, I feel like uppercase is probably easier to parse visually, so I'm not sure why I've adopted lowercase. But again, if you wanna use uppercase uh, tags, I think they're easier to read, so definitely up to you. Um, but yeah, so we have a title tag here and then the body, the body, if I want to add a comment there, just so we know what each section is doing, this section contains what your browser will. Okay. So anything you put in, within the body is actually what you'll see in your web page. So let's create just the simplest. Uh, content I can think of. I'm going to create a 
H1. Remember the sense for heading, heading level one. So this is gonna be my largest heading. I'm just gonna say, hello world. And with that, I would say this is probably the simplest web page um, that um, you can create. Again, HTML elements to create your document, a head section with a title in it. Notice that these are nested. So when I, when I mentioned nested before, this title element is fully nested within my head element here. So the contents of my head element is another element. And that element has more content inside of it. So again, this is the prop, this is the common structure. You're gonna see a lot of stuff nested within each other. Uh, it becomes, you know, if you become quite complicated, you might have like 12 different levels of nesting on which HTML. So um, can kind of get crazy there, but usually your formatting should kind of save you from um, kind of be driven mad by that. So formatting wise, um, you should always tab different levels. So this is the same principle as with like Python. It's not required. So let, let me make that clear. It's not required that you tab items. So I could totally um, like untab my title here. It's going to work fine. But visually reading this, it's going to be more difficult because it's like if I glance at this, at this for one second, I'm going to think this title tag is like not nested within this head tag, right? So tabbing um, is optional, but highly, highly, highly recommended that you tab each nested section so that you know, I can look at this in a split second and know that my H1 tag is nested within um, the body tag. Okay, so let's actually take a look at this web page. So again, as I said, this is a very simple web page, but contains all the key um, required items, which is the head section, body section, and some content so we can actually see something. So if I actually want to see this, I could run this from Visual Studio. I'm going to go start debugging, and there's nothing to debug. Uh, gives me an option. I'm going to choose Chrome over Edge. So I select Chrome. Should pop up at some point. There we go. Take a second. Uh, sorry, I need one more desktop here. All right, so throw that over here. All right, this is my first web page. All right, let's just kind of highlight what we see here. We see hello world. This is the H1 header that I put in there. This is the contents of that H1 tag. So notice I don't see those anger brackets of H1 that I opened and closed, right? I don't see this nor this. These are used by the browser to specify how to display this content. Again, these body tags, these head tags, you don't see any of that in your web page. Those are just kind of parsed by the browser and not um, actually rendered. In, your, in the output. Also, if you can see my tab, I know the font might be a little small. This says my first HTML page. Again, this is coming from the title section, right? That I specified. Again, you don't have to have this. If I left it off, I think I'm, I'm actually not sure what's going to show. Let's uh, refresh this. All right, it just shows the name of the file in this case. So index.html, since I didn't have a title, I guess the browser somehow defaults to the title. So I think it just uses the name in here. Um, hopefully you guys were able to kind of code along with me. Were there any questions, um, any stumbling blocks that I lose you guys anywhere um, with creating this um, basic web page here? Mine ran. All right, good to hear. Um, all right, so again, this is our first web page. Pretty simple, nothing too exciting. We just have, you know, some text. So, all right, let's actually try to add some more contents here. So going back to our lecture, let's look at some common tags. Again, as I said, these dozen or so tags are probably going to be the most common you're going to see. So let's make sure we understand how to use them and kind of how to format them inside our HTML document. So we, I use an H1. Um, as I said, H2, H3, essentially the same thing. Um, if I want to just kind of highlight that since I'm on, on headers, I create H2. If I type it correctly, H2. And then let's just say. Oscar platoon. Again, this goes up, down all the way to H6. So let's say Monday H4, June 14th, 2021. Let's add in here. This is HTML week and H6. Again, H6 will be your smallest header. So let's just say donuts. Always have donuts on my mind. I'm going to save that. And then I'm going to refresh my page. 
and there we go. These are all the headers. Notice how you go from large to small. So even my heading six is quite tiny. I wanna make sure you guys can see that. So let me blow this up, but yep. Again, different levels. Usually, as I said, your main page title should be an H1. I'd say your, you know, your main sections should be a H2. There's no, again, there's no hard and fast rule. This is usually what I go with. So each section of your page should be probably an H2. I wouldn't say, I wouldn't want to use H1 consistently. Um, and then, yeah, every subsections might use some small headings, but totally up to you how you want your page to look. Um, so they have six headings for you to use at, at your discretion. All right, so that, that takes care of headers. Uh, pretty straightforward, but again, stop me for sure if uh, you guys are lost on any of these um, tags that we're using, because again, we want to make sure we know how to use them so that um, we can develop with them. Okay, what else do we have? We have paragraph tags and links. So let's introduce those. So I'm going to, I'll keep these headers there, whatever. Let's create a new header here, H2, using paragraphs, using more tags. All right, so create another section sort of here, and then I'm going to create a paragraph. So again, paragraphs are the main uh, tags that will create contain your textual data. So in this case, I'll say this is a paragraph. I don't really know what to You create multiple paragraphs. So if I want a new paragraph, um, today is Monday, June 15th, 2021. I didn't. So again, you can put um, textual content here, um, multiple paragraphs. So these are non-nested. So notice again, my tabbing should clue you into how these are um, kind of being organized. I have a heading two tag. This paragraph tag is not nested within that H2 because I've closed that H2. I've started a new element here um, with this P tag. So this is another element that is not nested within the H2, but it is still nested within my body tag. So again, the tabbing should be Pretty evident there. Then I have another paragraph after that, which is independent, as in not nested within any of the previous two elements there. So I save that, and again, want to refresh, refresh my page. All right, there we go. I got another, you know, H two here, and I got some paragraphs here. So notice that these uh, paragraph tags are not bold by default. H one or heading tags are always bold, even if like down to my H six tag. That is still bold, it's just a very tiny font. In fact, it's a, it's a smaller font than the default font of my browser. But um, yeah, the, this is not bolded. All right, let me actually minimize or reduce the size of that. Um, all right, so that's a paragraph tag. Keep in mind, again, just to go over some past concepts, paragraph tags are block level elements. So notice that my paragraph here I completed that paragraph and started a new paragraph. That paragraph did not start on the same line, even though that this, this textual line didn't take up the entire horizontal space. When I started a new paragraph, it started on a new line. The reason is because a paragraph tag is a block level element, meaning it's gonna just take up the entire space anyway. Even though there's no, no text here, it's taking up this entire horizontal space. Same thing with heading tags or header tags. Um, they are block level elements. So when you open and close a header tag and start a new one, it's going to be on a new line automatically because the entire block or entire horizontal space is occupied by that element. And once we, if we get into CSS, we could probably see this more visually. But again, the text ends here, but the element ends at the very end of this line. All right. So these are block level elements, but we could also have inline elements. So um, most common inline elements is the anchor tag. So we mentioned that before, that's how you create links. So let's actually create a link here. Um, all right, I'm going to add a link. So again, these are inline elements, so you can nest them within block level elements or again, in other inline elements and they're not gonna you know, create a new line. So let's say I wanna create an anchor tag inside of my paragraph that I had here. So I'm gonna add uh, anchor tag, opening and closing one automatically got added for me. Um, so let me actually move that one because I want to surround tennis match with an anchor line. So now that I've surrounded 
tennis match, that text with anchor uh, tags, that's gonna make that a link, all right? So if I save this and go over here, uh, all right, so there's nothing there because I need href. So again, href, kind of a weird attribute name, but this is what actually will dictate where that link will go to. So in this case, I want to go, let's just say French Open final result. Where do I want to go? Uh, let's go with ESPN. Sure, we'll go to the tennis link. Okay, so I'm going to copy this URL and that because that's where I want my link to go. So it's going to be ESPN.com slash tennis. Um, maybe I'll click on one more. All right, so I want to go to this page. I'm going to copy that URL, go to my um, editor, and uh, in quotation marks, so don't forget your quotes um, for attribute values. I'm going to paste that entire URL. So this one's kind of long. Um, but that's my entire URL. Sorry, I can. Boy in the stands and gave your racket to him. Have you done that before? Who was that? Oh, and we talk a bit about that. Moment. Sorry, video was playing. I thought someone was speaking. Um, all right, so that is my uh, link, and then that is surrounding tennis match. So now, if I save this and refresh, notice I get this hyperlink, this blue underlined text that we've all seen before, probably. This means I can actually click on this. So when I hover over it, notice my um, cursor kind of changes to a glove that you know kind of can poke or click on it. Versus this text, I get the the I forget the name of this, uh, but this text highlighter cursor. All right. So I created an anchor tag, surrounded some text, so that my end user can click on something. If I didn't surround anything here, like if I had nothing here, well, that link wouldn't really show up, right? Because uh, we need something for the user to interact with. In this case, it's Tennis match. So if I actually click on that, I can open up a new link and that should go to that ESPN page. Fortunately, there's a video that auto plays on that, so it's kind of annoying. Taking a hot second, but yep, eventually it should get there. Not sure why it's taking forever. It's loading, it's loading, I promise it's coming up. All right, it'll come up, I think. Maybe. All right, there we go. So it came up eventually. Not sure why it took like 10 seconds. Anyway, that's how you use anchor tags. So anchor tags, um, the key thing is href. That's an attribute that you pretty much need in your anchor tags to get a functionality. Otherwise, the anchor tags can be kind of pointless. Um, yeah, so again, this is an attribute. href is an attribute of the anchor tag. And my attribute value is um, the URL I provided in quotation marks. All right, and then also, don't forget your closing tags. That's very important. If I don't add this closing tag, I'm actually curious what will happen. But I save that. Again, I took away my closing tag here. Let's see what my browser does with that. Um, OK, it seems to work. So maybe it, it smartly, I guess, actually, no, my period here is still in the link. So maybe let's um, jazz this up a little bit more. So you know, if I had a closing tag here, then I had more text here. Uh, Djokovic won his 19th major. All right, so if I save this with the closing tag here. All right, so notice tennis match is the only thing that's part of my link. And it's now purple because I've clicked on it. Um, you can control that with your styling, but um, this link has been clicked on. Um, I can still click on it, it'll work. But if I take away this closing tag and save it, let's see what happens now. Notice that this added sentence, Djokovic won his 19th major, also is part of my link. The reason is because your browser did not find a closing tag. It's just going to go to the next closing tag and assume that, I guess, this anchor tag is going to be closed here also. So again, that's you know the danger of not providing a closing tag. You might kind of screw up your page and not have the correct um, content that you intended to have. OK. so. Just always, always remember, have a closing tag um, for any tag that you open. Again, uh, your editor, uh, VS Code, uh, most smart editors will, you know, when you open a tag, will create a closing one for you just to help you out there. So um, yeah, usually you don't have to remember manually, but you should always be conscious of it. Okay, so that takes care of our anchor tag. We have a few more. 
that I want to go over, and then we'll take a short break after that. So image tag, um, again, this is how you display images. No surprise there. Let's actually throw an image here. So <clears throat> let's go with set some comments in here, just to divide up our section. So let's do images. And uh, okay, so to put an image, so um, sorry, kind of jumping around the place here. Just to reiterate this, this anchor tag is an inline element. So that did not create a new line when I created it. That is nested within a paragraph tag. Um, images are um, block level, but you can kind of control that um, if you don't want them to be block level. Images have an SRC attribute, and this is, this is what specifies um, what image you actually want to display. So since I'm running out of my local environment, I could just have a you know, local image here, or I could specify a URL. So um, I think usually you'd be linking to our URL, so let's find a nice image to display. Um, let's say tennis ball PNG. Let's find a nice image. Looks like I have a lot of tennis ball images to use. Um, let's just use this one, so good enough. Click on it. I uh, do want to download it. I just want a URL here. Sorry, I need to find something else to need a URL. All right, they're all blocking my access. Um, you know what? I'm just going to take this image. All right, so I wanted a PNG, but this is going to be a JPEG probably. So I copy the URL. I'm going to paste it into my browser. Paste, please. Not copy that correctly. Control copy image link is what I want. I'll paste that in here. All right, there we go. So this is the location of that uh, image, whatever Google found for me. And then I need to close this tag. So an image tag is an empty tag as it has no actual content. So I'm going to close that tag right here. Um, so this image tag is both an opening image tag and a closing image tag all in one. All right, so I have a source. Um, usually for development, you're going to want to provide an alt tag. Um, usually you'll see warnings by your um, VS code will probably show a warning or React will definitely show a warning if you don't provide an alt tag. An alt tag is just in case this image does not render or does not exist, like if we can't find this image, the alt tag will be a text description of the image. So in this case, I'll say um, tennis ball, simple enough. Um, again, this isn't 100% required, but I'd say like that 99% just recommend, highly, highly, highly recommended. So just add an alt tag anytime you're providing a, a source also. And that's also for accessibility. Yep, you're, you're right. Like um, if I hover over that image, I'll get a tooltip that says tennis ball. Also, um, I think, yeah, other, um, parts of the browser might use that for, yeah, people that might have visual impairments might uh, be able to, actually, I'm not sure how that will be used there. But yeah, this alt tag um, gets used in other ways. So if I save this and go back to my web page, refresh, there we go, we get a giant tennis ball. All right, so quite large. I probably don't want it this large. So we can, we can try using other attributes. And maybe that'd be a good time to kind of look at documentation. So let's let's investigate this image tag, right? Let's say I don't know, don't know too much about it. I want to learn about it. So there's tons of resources. Let's just say image HTML tag. Uh, W3 Schools, great resource. So I'm going to click on the first result because I trust their content. So yeah, they give you an example of what an image tag looks like. They also talk about you know some attributes. So this is these are the couple that I talked about. SRC specifies the path to the image. Alt specifies the, the text for the image, and then if the image can't be displayed, the browser will just show the text there. Um, you know, there might be compatibility issues. So in this case, it's showing, yep, the image tag works on Chrome, um, Edge or Explorer, uh, Chrome, sorry, Firefox, Opera, and Safari. So, you know, most major browsers will support the image tag. Um, but again, some you might have some tags that aren't fully supported. Uh, I'm not aware of any from this list that might be you know, not supported by one of these browsers, but you could, you might encounter that. So just be aware of that as a developer. Um, you can have more attributes. So um, here's a list of attributes that the image tag can contain. So notice, uh, you know, we have our SRC that we talked about, alt or ALT. 
and a description of those attributes, but we also have some like height or width, you know, that's pretty common, especially in my case, like I have a giant tennis ball, probably too large for, than what I wanted. So maybe let's, uh, let's shrink that a bit. I'm gonna go to my um, editor again, maybe break this into multiple lines. Right, let's make the heights uh, 400 uh, pixels and the width, let's keep it consistent. Let's keep it a square. So if I do 400 pixels there, let's see how my image reacts. All right, notice it shrunk a bit. Uh, it's still a little large for my tastes. So I'm actually gonna shrink it some more. Um, I could skew this. So let's say I wanna make it the height 200 and like the width 600. Like I can kind of stretch it, um, The or I can specify the specific sizes and the browser will stretch the image um, to meet my requirements. So notice I get that, you know, kind of elongated tennis ball. Looks kind of like a football now, um, kind of cool. But uh, yeah, I, I prefer my uh, tennis ball to be round. Um, so I'm gonna make it 200 by 200. PX stands for pixels. Um, I think you can have other um, units there, but I always use pixels. And when we get into CSS, we'll talk about different unit measurements. There's like EM, um, you can default it to um, some other aspects on the page, but pixels for me are easy enough to understand. So I'm gonna go with pixels. So save that, refresh. All right, got a decent sized tennis ball here. Um, again, we incorporated some additional attributes for this image tag. Those being height and width. So again, I I'm not gonna pretend like I've memorized every attribute out there. There's no way I'm going to do that, nor would I be capable of doing that. But documentation, we we mentioned documentation, you know, uh, a ton in the past three weeks. It's gonna come up more, especially with HTML and CSS, just because it requires more memorization in, this, in the sense of you can't really deduce, you know, what what attribute a certain tag might have. You just gotta either know it or look it up. Like there's no real other way to go about it. Um, again, there's ad additional attributes. If you are curious, you can kind of do your own research, but different tags have different attributes. So if I go to a paragraph tag, for example, um, we used a paragraph tag earlier. Let's scroll down. They have examples here. So you kind of edit this and try it yourself. So again, W3 School is a great resource. Um, I guess here they don't really list specific attributes, but you can have um, additional attributes for paragraph tags. Um, Okay, so that takes care of our image tag. Let's finish up the bottom three and then we'll take a while to sort of break here. Um, before I proceed down the list, spacing and sections, any questions on any of the tags you've used so far? So headers, text, links, or images, they all kind of make sense. They're still um, with me here. I got a yeah. question, but it's more like, I won't say advanced per se, but it's something we can probably talk about later down the road? Um, sure, if you want to pose your question and then we can maybe punt on it or if it makes sense to answer here, we'll, we'll love to hear it. Well, no, I was gonna say, I'm trying to remember how to set the image to the background, that's all. Gotcha. Um, I know the CSS way to do it, so we haven't gotten to CSS. So uh, I will say let's table that the question. There might be a way to do it with just the image tag. Um, I would have probably had to look that up, but I'm just gonna default to CSS because that's easier to do it that way. But great yeah. question. Yep. Hey, Anker. Um, I guess it's more of a comment. When normally, whenever you're working with HTML and CSS, you normally want to keep um, like adjusting your elements with CSS. You normally don't want to mix the two together. Is how I've always heard it. Um, yeah. So for CSS, so CSS will usually be in a separate file. You can embed it within your HTML elements, and we'll talk about that when we get to our CSS section. Um, but yeah, usually you don't want to have your CSS inside of your HTML document. You can, and it can work. It's kind of like the quick and dirty way to do it. If you don't want to create a separate style sheet, um, you can create your styles in line. And so when we get to CSS, we'll talk about all the various ways you can have CSS styles. There's three main ways. You could have it in line. You would have it in the current file or the most common ways to have an external file. Um, but yeah, uh, great, great point there. Uh, usually you don't want to uh, clutter your HTML with CSS kind of makes it a little harder to read and kind of disorganized um, in the design uh, aspect. All right, so we talked about images. Let's complete with lists and then spacing and sections. Those are going to be really quick to go over. So almost to our break here. So lists, we have order lists, unordered lists, and then list items that work with either of these. So let's uh, create an example of that. Um, I guess we'll add on to this page. So let's create a new uh, dividing section. Let's say H2. I'll just say tennis 
pitchers. Okay, so I don't know if you guys are tennis fans, but there's uh, majors, which are just like the, the main championships or tournaments that they have throughout the year. And there's four main ones. So I'm gonna create an order, uh, unordered list for that. There's no real priority. I guess there's an ordering in the calendar but um, they're all you know, unique and special in their own right. So I don't really want to give like a ordering in this case. So I'm gonna use unordered list. That is the UL tag that I just opened here. And there's a corresponding closing tag. Inside of UL tags or ordered list when we get to them, you always use list item. So LI stands for list item. These are actually meaning your bullet points um, with the content in there. So if I create a list item, um, I'm gonna, again, I, know, I don't know who's a tennis fan and who's not, but I'm gonna try to just give a pop quiz to anyone. Um, Eric Berger, can you name one of the tennis tournament, major tennis tournaments, if you happen to know any of them? Uh, Australian Open, US Open, French Open, and Wimbledon. Gotcha, you got all four. I was, I was gonna go for one, but yep, Eric knows his stuff. So Australian Open, gotta make sure I can spell these. Australian Open, um, that takes place in Melbourne. Uh, then we have, uh, let's just go in the calendar order. We have French Open, that's uh, in Paris. Then we also have Wimbledon. Wimbledon, that's, well, my, that's on a tag, sorry. Uh, Wimbledon, that takes place in London, I believe, or somewhere around there. Uh, and then we finally have yeah, the London. US Open. Why am I creating tags there? And then we have the US Open which is in Queens, New York. I have actually been to that one. One of my lifetime goals, I'm not sure if I'll make it, is to make all four majors. So US Open's the easiest one for me to get to since I live in the US. Uh, New York's not too far away, but yeah, it'd be nice to get to these other three. I think Australia would be really fun, though it's like in the peak of summer in Australia, so it can be quite uh, uh, gruesome um, or grueling. Uh, French Open uh, is in Paris. They're on a clay court and the Wimbledon's. I think from what I know, it's like the hardest ticket to get because there's just so much demand for it. Um, the Brits love their tennis, so yeah. But maybe I'll make it to all four of these, who knows? Anyway, so I created an unordered list. Um, so again, UL and then LI are the list. Items. So if I save this and find out quickly with the rendering here, there we go. So down here, tennis majors, um, if you can see at the bottom of my corner of my screen, uh, this was the heading section I created. And then this is my unordered list. I just have these round bullet points and the items I listed. Okay, let's uh, go with the other list. Um, let's just create another section, just for fun. Let's just say, I don't know. NBA playoff teams? Uh, sure, we'll do NBA playoff teams seeds. All right, so this is gonna be ordered as in there's ordering to it, um, as in, I'm not sure how else to say that, but all right. So okay, H2, order list is OL, and you still use the same LI tag, which is list items. So in this case, um, let's, uh, I think Tim, Tim seems to be a big uh, basketball guy. So Tim, I'm gonna put you on the spot without looking up. Can you name the seating of each team in the, let's go with Eastern Conference. Uh, it should be Brooklyn Nets would be one and the Bucks are two, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, I think you are mistaken. I think Philly is one, right? I, I forget right now. I'm talking about my head. I think Philly got the one seed and then Brooklyn. I could be wrong too. Um, Brooklyn. And then three seed was the Bucks, I think. Uh, four seed was, I don't even know. Uh, I, I think it's the Hawks. Oh, okay, right. Yeah, they had a surprisingly good year uh, at Atlanta. And then I know the fifth seed, which was probably a surprise for everybody. The Knicks made it back to the playoffs after years and years and years of. Um, it was like 15. It was like 15 years or something like that, or 11 yeah, years. They were garbage for quite some time. Apologies to any Knicks fans out there. Um, all right. Uh, six seed, anyone? Milwaukee played someone. And then I think, right, I think it was Miami. Either Miami was either seventh or eighth seed. I think Miami sounded correct. And then uh, lists. Brooklyn played someone. We don't have to go through all this, but if you want to complete it, anyone know? All right. Oh, the Celtics. 
Right. Yep. They actually, they actually swept them. <laughs> Didn't the Celtics win one? Oh, yeah, 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 right. Because he won game three, I think. But honestly, he should have swept. <laughs> and, he and then Philly played someone. Uh, okay. I'll leave that off. Washington, Washington, Washington right. Wizards. Thank you. All right, we'll fill this out. Sorry for the extra level of detail. But, yep, these were eight playoff teams, again, in, in the NBA tournament. They are seeds. So there's a top seed, as in the best team in that conference gets the number one seed. And then there are ranks uh, downward. So if I save that and go to my order list. Um, so here we go. We got order list. We got one, two, three, four, so forth. Um, there might be a question out there. And I'm going to, I guess, circumvent it because I, I don't know. But I'm pretty sure if you wanted to have like a different ordering, like if you wanted to start at seven instead of like one, or if you want to have duplicate numbers, like I was, I was initially going to do like list of um, men's tennis players that have the most majors. So like Federer and Nadal are tied at 20. I'm not sure if there's an easy way to kind of have like a shared, like a one and a one. So in that case, you might just have to do it manually um, instead of using an order list in that case. But the normal order list where you just want, you know, one through whatever number, you just want to list them, you use the OL order list and then LI for list elements. Okay, so that takes care of our lists. And then the last thing I want to go over quickly, um, spacing and section. So let's actually add some spacing in here. So I'm going to add some HRs, which will are horizontal lines. So notice, you know, I have sections. Might be kind of nice to divide those up a little better. So I'm going to go to my editor over other side. Um, let's add some HRs and see what they actually do. So HRs are just basically a horizontal line that gets added to your page. One thing I can mention, HRs, as I mentioned, are empty elements as they don't have any content. Your browser will still work fine if you don't self-close your HR elements. So in this case, technically, you should always close your elements with a forward slash. This is an opening and closing element. So that forward slash, highly, highly recommended. If you leave it off, it's going to be fine. Um, so let's do that the proper way. And let's actually do it the improper way. So maybe add HR here. And then to move my image down a little bit, get underneath my tennis list. Okay, so I added to HR and notice this does not have a closing, um, a closing corresponding part of the tag. I'm just using HR. Again, this will be fine, but not proper or not recommended that you do this just because you can do it. All right, so have HR there, let's add a, one more HR between my next section. Okay, so HR stands for horizontal rule. Let's see what those look like. Refresh this page. All right, notice we got these lines rendered by the browser. So the browser found an HR tag and decided to put in lines because um, that's how it uses HR tags. Yep, so I feel like my sections are a little easier to divide up. That's the main purpose of using HR tags, just to create more, you know, more visual uh, dividers for your user. Okay, that's the HR um, BR. As I said, it stands for break lines. So let's say, um, let's say I want to add more lines between these these two paragraphs. I can add as many break lines as I want. So br, um, br, br, as many as I want. Um, again, usually you want to close these because they are empty tags. Um, also, usually you want to put each element on new lines. Again, you don't have to. I could again not do what I had before. Like this, this totally is fine. It just makes it a little harder to read um, for your end user if they're reading your HTML. But again, I have three break lines here. So that should just add some more space between my two paragraphs here. So notice there's not much space between them. I refresh and boom, I get a lot of space here. One uh, little more peculiar space element that I didn't list on the slides is called the no break space. So this one has weird syntax. It's Ampersand, NB, SP, semicolon. All right, <laughs> that's again, NB stands for non breaking, and then SP stands for space. So HTML is a little weird in that you can't just add random spaces in there and then expect the browser to pick it up. So the way that I could show this is let's say I'm adding all these spaces here and I'm putting a um, new word here. All right, so in this paragraph, I added a bunch of space here. And put a new word, you know, after those spaces. So if I save this and refresh, 
notice I don't have those spaces here. Like in my editor, I had a bunch of spaces, but the browser is like, nah, we're, we're just gonna eat all those spaces and have only one space. Um, this is just a peculiarity of, you know, browsers or how they render HTML. I'm not sure the decision behind um, that, but if you do want those spaces, that's where the non-breaking space character comes in. So I'm gonna paste, 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 a bunch of non-breaking spaces, all right? So now I have five of those here. If I save this, go back here, notice I get a few more spaces there. Maybe not as much as I envisioned, but you could add as many new breaking spaces as you want. Again, this just adds actual spaces, like a spacebar character um, to your lines. So again, um, BR, where I had it, or I lost my space, where was my BR? Maybe I got rid of my BR, but yeah, BR is basically the equivalent of a new line character that we're familiar with in like Python or whatever other programming language. This creates a new line. Non-breaking space is the same thing as a space bar character or a space character. Okay, so that takes care of spacing. The last thing, um, the last two I wanna talk about are divs and spans. As I mentioned, these are kind of like invisible in terms of they don't really add anything to your web page on the front end, as in your user won't see anything different. So let's say I wanna add a div here. Let's add a div around this section. I create a div element and that's going to create a closing tag. I want to nest my NBA team seeds. Let's make sure we're clear. This is Eastern Conference. I'll be correct. Um, and then I need a closing div. All right. So this div tag includes this H2 tag and this um, ordered list. Um, I think so. The good thing about VS Code, you kind of nest sections. If you hover over like the where the number lines are, you get these carrots. If I want to close this entire section, I can close it. So it kind of collapses that entire section. So this can be useful if you want to just get more space for development. Or you want to just close all these sections. Um, I can close my entire head section or my entire body section. So now it's just more condensed. So kind of nice that you can kind of close and open those as needed. So my div section, again, that included an H2 tag and an ordered list. Um, this div, if I save it, I'm going to refresh my page. Notice nothing's going to change. Oh, sorry, I added this in. The div did not do that. Apologies there. Um, but yeah, nothing changed when I added that div. My list and my heading looks exactly the same. Again, I can create another div and nest it again. So you again, you can nest as many times as you need to. Um, in this case, these divs aren't adding any visual uh, content for my web page. But there are purposes for div, like they're not just pointless, um, pointless elements or pointless tags that exist. Okay, so I nested a div within a div, totally legal, nothing wrong with that. Um, and then I have my H2 section. Again, if I refresh here, nothing should change. Again, I didn't change any content. Notice this looks the same, it's like the formatting, the spacing, exactly the same. We do the same thing with spans. So let's go back to my paragraphs. Let's create a span for paragraph, span. Here. And then I'm going to close my paragraph text. Span. Again, this is not going to add any difference right now. When we talk about CSS, that's when spans and divs start to make more sense. But it's just another way to create more subsections within your HTML document, not your HTML content that's rendered. All right, so I created this span. Um, if I go back to my page, which was up here, again, I put a span around this paragraph text, nothing's going to change. If I refresh, notice I, I definitely did refresh. Nothing changed here. All right. So again, spans and divs are invisible, but they have a purpose. And they'll make more sense when we get to talk about CSS. But they're, they're pretty important, so definitely want to make sure we cover them. Um, all right. Any questions on any of the tags we use, any of the syntax you saw, any additional uh, questions about um, an HTML document? I'm going to add back my title since I took that out. So again, my first HTML page, I think I named it. What questions do you guys have? What kind of folder structure should we, or what kind of folder structure would you recommend when we add CSS and JavaScript? Uh, great question. Uh, if it's a simple web page, so for now we're gonna be creating like an HTML document, probably a CSS. I create like a styles right next to it, like style.css, and then another, um, let's just say, script.js, that's a common name for JS. I usually keep it on the same level. 
Um, if you get more advanced where you have like multiple script files, multiple style sheets, I'd probably create a folder that says like styles, nest that in here. It's more or less up to you. Um, I don't have a great recommendation, so I'm not gonna, you know, suggest what I think is best, but however you think it's best organized, just kind of go with your gut. Uh, you can probably look at online um, to kind of have more authoritative how to organize you know, HTML files, you could do a quick Google. Um, but yeah, I'm not gonna waste your time Googling for you. So you could always Google, but great question. Um, always good to be mindful of writing uh, clean code and also having a clean directory structure. All right, well, we'll talk about CSS um, after our break. Uh, JavaScript will not be introduced today. So I'm gonna just delete this file. Um, okay, cool. That takes care of our HTML introduction. Hopefully you guys are kind of getting familiar with HTML if you've never done it before. Again, it's a lot of memorization. Um, the last thing I should point out, if we go to our curriculum page, we have a link that's probably gonna be your best friend or one of your best friends. Um, HTMLreference.io, great site, highly recommend it. So I wanna make sure we click on it and look at it. This site will list pretty much every HTML tag that exists. So if I scroll down, just kind of casually, notice, as I mentioned, there's probably 100 or, or more, maybe not 100, I think I ballparked it. I don't know, I can't guesstimate it, but looks like around 100 tags. Um, so if you're curious about other tags that exist, you can click on them. Notice they kind of give you a sum summary of how the tags behave. So notice an anchor tag, if I blow this up a little bit, is an inline tag. So it kind of just gives you a quick uh, cheat sheet to kind of look it up. If I look at the paragraph tag, which we also covered, paragraph, where are you? There you are. Notice paragraph is listed as block. So it's a tag is either inline or block. So it's one or the other. Um, you also have self-closing, which is the same as an empty tag. So we looked at uh, anchor tag again, should be, I guess anchor tag is not self-closing, sorry, image tag is what I wanted. Image is not, is self-closing. So that means it just has no content. You open an image tag and close that the same, with the same angle brackets. So again, a nice, uh, nice website, definitely recommend it just to get a, a list of elements or tags you might encounter. Also there's meta. So these are the tags that are gonna be used inside of your head section. So I kind of glaze over that, but you could have a meta tag, you have a no scripts, um, you'll put your CSS link in your head tag. So we'll get to that. But title tag is also, I guess, meta tag. This is an experimental tag. I'm not sure what WBR is. Defines location. Okay, that's interesting. It's like a placeholder for a line break. So it's not a break line, it's a placeholder for a break line. I'm not familiar with it, but cool. Great site. Definitely. Uh, I think that's something new. Yeah, yeah it's, it's experimental. So it's probably in development or I'm not sure what status it is. But yeah, so definitely make use of references online, whether it be hmlreference.io or whatever uh, one you find. But you're going to be looking up stuff constantly. So make sure you find a best friend in terms of a reference online. OK, uh, sorry for going kind of long. Let's uh, take a break here. All right, so hopefully everyone can get back from break. Um, let's dive into CSS. Also, that stands for Cascading Style Sheets. Um, just to back up a bit, let's uh, kind of review why we want CSS. So if I go back to my analogy that I had here, um, we talked about HTML. So we defined how to give our page a structure, and we saw how our browser actually renders it. So at this point, you know, we're fully functional in the sense that you know, we have a body that we can use. Um, but I'll kind of just compare this, you know, if you go out in public and, you know, without clothes on, well, A, you're going to get some very awkward stares and you're probably going to get shunned from society. Um, likewise, without CSS, your website is probably going to get some really awkward stares and your website is probably going to get shunned from the internet, right? So if I look at the page that I created earlier, like this is pretty ugly to look at, just objectively speaking, there's not much styling, you know, the fonts, the alignments, um, you know, it gets the job done, right? Like the content, like I listed the tennis majors, I have the NBA, like, so like content wise, I have everything I need, but presentation wise, this is quite horrendous. Uh, I don't know if you would agree, but I, I definitely would not want to look, use a web page that looks like this. So that's, um, again, in our analogy, like we have these two components going, but we want to be kind of, uh, you know, have good presentation. So that's where CSS comes into play. So CSS controls the look and the layout of your web page or of the content on your web page, so it doesn't really add again any additional, I guess, content or functionality, but it it gives you a much better presentation. So that's why CSS is pretty important in terms of web development. 
All right, so let's uh, dive into our CSS. Conquer, were you going to screen share again? Oh, was I not doing that? I always seem to forget one or the other. I remember the recording, but I forgot the screen share. All right, sorry. Um, thank you. Yep, so yeah, just going over the analogy again. I uh, apologize. So we had our structure, which is our skeleton. Our browser gives us the rendering um, using the skeleton. At this point, everything works, but we want to style it up. So in this case, we want to look presentable. We don't want to be shown from the internet. So that's why CSS is very important to us. Again, apologies for bringing the screen share. Thank you for catching on that. So let's talk about CSS. Um, CSS stands for Cascading Style Sheets. Maybe kind of an awkward name, but uh, definitely sensible once we understand how CSS um, works. So let's, uh, let's talk about it. What is CSS used for? So um, as we brought up earlier, CSS is used to design web pages versus HTML is used to structure web pages. Um, if we go back to um, our, our other analogy before about building a house, so um, CSS is used to define the visual presentation of web page. So if we're building a house, CSS would be how you decorate your actual house. So once you have the, you know, the walls, the floors, ceilings, stairs, like foundation built, um, how do you actually make your home like a, your, how do you make your house a home, right? So that's where you determine what paint uh, colors you want to use on the wall, um, what curtain, what flooring, you know, every, every like piece of furniture, that's part of CSS. Um, kind of just making it more personal, more presentable. Um, CSS also um, cascading style sheets are used so that you can have the same look and feel across multiple web pages. So when you have a website, ideally your entire website should look consistent. You don't want to have like one web page using a different color scheme than another, unless you have a legit reason to do so. So um, yeah, so again, CSS uh, very useful for uh, kind of quickly uh, creating styles um, that can be reused across multiple web pages. Okay, so we're gonna get back into some terminology with CSS. Um, luckily, it's a little simpler than the HTML terminology, but a CSS document consists of CSS selectors. All right, so selectors is a word you'll be hearing often with CSS. A selector consists of a collection of properties. All right, so properties sort of similar to attributes in HTML. So a property consists of name value pairs. All right, so let's make sure we understand that terminology, make sure you know the buzzwords that are highlighted here. So selectors, properties, name value pairs, um, to make sure you understand what we're getting at here. As always, probably best to see an example. So this is the uh, syntax for creating a selector. Um, in this shade of light blue, um, you give it a selector name. These selector names correspond to HTML elements or classes or IDs of elements. We'll talk about those shortly. Basically, there's just gonna be a selector name, then you use a uh, curly bracket to open the selector scope. Then inside of that, you might have various properties. You might have one property, you might have 20 properties all in that same selector. So in this case, the selector has two properties that it's set. Um, the property has a name. So again, these the are just placeholders, but you'll get you, each property has a name and each property has a value. So just make sure you understand the syntax here. So again, selector name, curly bracket to open that selector, uh, curly bracket to close it. Kind of similar to like JavaScript functions, if you remember the syntax of that, but totally different concept. So I probably should, shouldn't bring up JavaScript. Um, but yeah, so property, colon, and then you have the value and then semicolon. All right, and then you have multiple properties, same thing, another property name, colon, uh, give it a value and then semicolon. You wanna see a quick example? Um, in this case, this is a body selector. This body corresponds to the body tag in my HTML. So this body tag is what's being referenced in that, in that example. So I have a body tag there. Um, my body selector is selecting that tag. And we'll talk about what selecting actually means. But in this case, this is specifying that my body tag should have a color. So color is the property I'm setting here. And the value of that color property is gonna be this. So in this case, this is saying my body should use a default color of whatever color this is. Um, color, colors are often represented in hexadecimal uh, values. Uh, I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with hexadecimal, but just a, uh, a way to kind of 
um, instead of using binary hexadecimal is another format. So if we want to quickly go over that to make sure everyone's on the same page, let's create a new file. Let's call it block. Let's call it hex dot uh, txt. Let's create a text file. So hexadecimal, so binary, if we're familiar with binary, they're just ones and zeros. So again, our computer represents everything's in one and zero. It's a flip, it's a switch that's either flipped or not flipped. So that's what a one and zero represents. Um, hexadecimal is just a more condensed way to represent binary. So the way hexadecimal works, it takes sec uh, section of four, um, four bits and creates a value for that. So these four here were represented by a hexadecimal digit. Decimal. Um, so in this case, uh, I got to remember what this is. So uh, this is equivalent to, what is it? Eight, nine. nine, nine. So this in hexadecimal is nine. Hexadecimal is similar to decimal. So decimal, uh, let's go over the uh, number types, kind of take a quick uh, tangent. Hex decimal is base 10, uh, base 16, and binary means base two. So base just means how many actual digits you have. So in, in base two, you only have one and zero. So if I had an example of binary, um, binary example, uh, which I kept my number. All right, so let's say this is my binary number. Again, I only have one and zeros to work with in binary. So in this case, this represents some number. If I actually, um, the human way, so when I say human way, we, we're used to decimal numbers. So this is base 10. So this same number um, can be represented in decimal and I don't wanna do it myself. So I'm just gonna go to a um, calculator, binary to decimal calculator. Always good to have uh, nice uh, tools online that I can, uh, use. So binary, so I'm gonna enter binary number. I made some number up. Let's see what it is in decimal. Okay, so this number in binary is the same as 217 in decimal or our common number convention. So that's the same thing as 217. Hexadecimal uses base, base 16. So we actually have more than 10 digits to use. So hexadecimal is actually, it's gonna be digits zero through nine plus A through um, F. All right, so this gives us 16 digits. This A represents a 10 and then B is 11. C is 12 and then F all the way goes up to 15. So we're base, we're starting at zero. So F is gonna be 15. That gives us 16 digits to use. So in hex, um, 217 will be uh, represented in a different way. So if I- D9. D9, I, okay, this calculator takes care of it. So D9 is what this breaks down to. The reason why hex is useful with binary is because um, 16 is a, uh, power of two, meaning if I have a binary number, I could divide this into chunks of four. So notice this, these are eight digits in binary. I could divide that into two chunks of four. This gets one digit. So in this case, this equates to nine in hexadecimal. And then this section equates to a D. Um, if I wanted to make that a little more clear, we could convert it to decimal first. So the first block here equates to uh, 13. If you want to I'm not going to go into how to compute binary numbers, but um, it's basically just taking powers of two. So the first block uh, equates to 13, and then the second block equates to nine. So we take, this is what the decimal representation of these individual units would be. In hex, it's D and nine, and you can just combine those to uh, get you what you want. In this case, you can't just combine these for decimal and get the same decimal number. That's a different situation. Okay, so that's what that's what hexadecimal is. That's often used to represent colors. So let's talk about colors. Colors, if we remember maybe from you know kindergarten or first grade, whenever we learned them, um, we have primary colors. In um, in the painting world, so for artists that are using paints, the primary colors are red, green. Oh, sorry, red, yellow, and blue. This is in. Uh, these are primary for paints. All right, the unfortunate thing or just the odd thing is colors um, in for lights, the primary colors are red, green, and blue. So this is primary for lights. All right, just something, some distinction to know about because you know, when I was growing up, I always was taught the primary colors are red, yellow, and blue because you could use paints to make the other colors. 
Um, this is for, I guess, let's say pigment. All right, so slight changes there, but want to make sure we understand. So colors are represented in red, green, and blue for light. And that's how your computer and uh, most you know, digital things will represent color in these three colors, base colors, red, green, and blue. So these are three sections. And usually those sections are given 256, um, I guess, levels of granularity. So the reason I'm going through all this is so we could talk about how colors are represented. So hex color is going to be six hex digits. And this hash is often used just to signify you're using a hex number versus a decimal versus a binary. So whenever you see this hash, just understand that's trying to represent um, a hex um, color or hex value. So in this case, we have two digits. Um, let's just say 0, 0, 1, 1, 2, 2. The first two digits in your hex color represent the red value. And I said this can represent up to 256 values. Why is it 256? Well, because the first hex digit here is up to 16 values. And then you get a second hex digit, which is also 16 values. So that's going to be 16 times 16 gives you 256 possibilities there. Likewise, the middle two represent your green value, and then the last two represent your blue value. So if I were looking at this number and just trying to mentally figure out what it is, quickly I could say, all right, we're leaning blue. There's definitely some blue here. There's no red here. There's a little bit of green. So it's going to be a very dark color because we're very close to zeros. Um, zero, 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 that's equal to black. Um, let me put this here. And then on the opposite side, we could have F, 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 F. This is equal to white. All right, so kind of just know the closer you are to the Fs, the brighter the color will be. If you have full colors in RGB, you can just have white. So if I had something like F, F, 0, 0, 0, 0, this is going to be full red because I have maximum red and nothing else kind of diluting it or mixing with it. If I had F, F, Zero zero FF. This is going to be red plus blue, which in our color wheel gives us like a fuchsia. I think I don't know if I spelled that correctly. Uh, let's just say bright pink to keep it simple. Okay, so again, you definitely don't want to memorize this. There's tons of online tools that will convert hex to colors or a color that you want to hex. Um, I'm sure I could find a color wheel here. So let's go through the motions. Color wheel hex. HTML color codes seems like a good choice here. Internet seems slow here. All right, so notice this is our entire span for red. I can pick any red I want, and I get the hex equivalent here. Also get an RGB value. Also get HSL. There's just different color representations. Um, CMYK is often for printers. They use cyan, magenta, yellow, and uh, K is black. But yep, yeah, again, you can find many sites like this. I can adjust the hue. So let's say I want a nice like teal color. That's bright teal. Well, that apparently is 00, zero FFD4 in hex. All right, so just a slight segue, but I think it's important to know colors. Um, but anyway, so that was a large tangent. Um, but anyway, this is just a moderately bright red is the color I'm setting for the body. Um, you can also align text. So you notice my website here, everything's kind of left aligned. Um, you can control the text alignment. So if I sit inside of the center, Everything on this page should be change of center if I apply this CSS um, property. Okay, so just a quick syntax example again selector, property name, property value. Don't forget your semicolons and colons. You guys with me? Yes, Question, questions on syntax? Okay, let's, uh, let's get more into it. Again, it's getting it a lot, uh, I wouldn't say theoretical, just a lot of definitions. So um, hopefully you guys can stay with me and then we'll get into some examples, which should be more fun. So location types, um, I forgot who asked this, might've been Alex, um, might've asked this, but um, you can have your styling code in various locations. The three main places you'll see them would be inline styles, which is specific to an element in your HTML document. This is usually rare. You're not going to see this uh, unless on exceptional um, cases. Internal styles, also known as embedded styles, these are styles that are specific to only one web page. Again, you're not probably going to, you might see this occasionally if like you're trying to override something. But for the most part, these two not heavily used from my understanding. The common case is you're, you will have an external style, which is basically an external CSS document that multiple web pages can uh, reference if they if you want, want to. So basically, this is how you achieve consistent styling across multiple web pages. 
So your website usually will have one or more um, external style sheets that your web pages will incorporate so that the font looks the same on every web page, the color scheme's the same, you know, the layout should generally be the same. Um, that's why an external style sheet generally makes sense. Okay, let's actually take a look at example of all three so we understand what's going on. Um, I forget what my next slide is. Yep, so let's look at an example. So <clears throat> this is an example of an inline style. In this case, I have a paragraph tag. I specify the style attribute. So pretty much every element has a style attribute you need to assign on it. And then I set the color to red. So this is the same thing I was doing with the body, but in this case, only this particular instance of the paragraph um, uh, element that I'm creating on this page, only this paragraph will have a color of red. Not all paragraphs on my page, only this paragraph. Again, the spacing here, um, I just want to make it clear. Usually, you're not going to have spaces between the equal sign and the, like, the value. You're going to see them condensed. I just added them there just for clarity. <clears throat> then you might have internal styles. This is what embedded means. Um, you can have a style tag and then specify a selector. So this is where you're getting more into actual CSS. Um, you can have a selector. So this is going to select a paragraph tag and set the color equal to red. In this case, this is going to apply for every paragraph um, element that I have on this web page where I have this style. Um, every paragraph is going to have the color, the four color of red. So the text will be displayed in red in this case. Um, maybe I might have lost you guys. So I apologize. Notice I'm using the word red here. There are pre reserved um, uh, words for colors. So your basic colors like red, blue, black, you can just write the actual the, the English wording for them. And it's going to basically convert that to a hexadecimal value um, behind the scenes. So it's gonna know that this is FF0000. So again, common colors, you could just use VX code. It actually will give you a nice, um, a nice like tool tip that shows you all the pre-coded colors. So let's actually just add a quick selector. I'm gonna do the body tag color. When I hit colon, I get this entire list of colors that kind of just have a textual name with it. It's actually quite a lot. So if I want to pick, Let's go with medium slate blue. That's quite a specific color. So I could just type medium slate blue and it's gonna know that medium slate blue is RGB 123, um, 104, 238. All right, so again, VS code will give you that list, um, but otherwise you'd always use the hex color if you don't have to know the name of the particular color you want. But yeah, that's kind of cool, kind of helpful. Um, Let's, let's save that and see, see what happens. I'm going to also do text line because I mentioned that in an example. Let's go with center. And let's just kind of see an example. So, I, oh, so I created this, but the key thing I lapsed on was this page that I had has no idea of this style sheet. We need to actually link them, as in, we need to tell our HTML page that, hey, we want to use the styles that are in this page. So, that is um, what an external style sheet would, uh, would need to do is that we need to link this to our HTML document. And we'll get to that uh, in a moment. All right, so we talked about internal styles. Again, you can create a style internally. So let's actually just do that since I want to show an example of it. Let's go to my page. All right, I have my HTML page. I'm going to create a style in my head section. So important, this goes in your head section. I'm going to create a style element. And here I could add some CSS. So let's do the paragraph example. And I think I had color and want something dark-ish. So I'm gonna go with maybe a darker red. Let's go with uh, BB0000. All right, so notice VS Code is quite helpful. Showed me a color box with that color. So it's kind of useful. Maybe I want a little darker. Let's go with a 99. Okay, cool. So I got like a nice maroon color. Um, can look kind of gross on my website, but I wanna just highlight it. Um, I'm also gonna use an example of an inline style. All right, so I'm going to create an inline style for, let's do one paragraph down here. So let's do it for this paragraph here. I'm gonna use the style attribute. I'm going to include a style here. So let's do color. I'm gonna pick a color from this list. If it comes back, all right. What's a good ugly color to look, use? Let's use so many options to choose from. I'm gonna go with sea green. All right, so I pick sea green for this paragraph only. So what my document is saying is all paragraphs should have this color, but I'm also saying that this paragraph should have this color. Um, and this is gonna get into a future um, discussion topic of 
well, which one is it actually going to pick? Is it going to pick the C green for this paragraph? Or is it going to um, be overridden by this value and say, well, this page is saying all paragraphs should be red, so we should use red. Um, I know the answer to this. Um, the answer is actually going to be green for this paragraph. So if I want to actually show this, notice that this paragraph became red because it was a paragraph tag. But this paragraph is that green color. The reason being is because I have an inline style for this paragraph versus this paragraph is using um, the embedded or the style for this entire page. Notice that these items have been untouched. Can someone tell me why these did not change colors? They're not paragraphs. Yep, simple enough. Um, I targeted with my style. This selector is, is targeting only paragraph elements. So you know this is an H1. These are unaffected by these styles. But since these two are the only paragraphs I have on this page, they get affected by either this style or I had an inline style here. Um, Al, I think as Alex mentioned Al, um, earlier, usually it's bad practice or you're not gonna see this often. You're not gonna have inline styles unless you have like a very super specific use case where you need something to be um, over, overriding the default style. All right, so this is inline and then this is embedded. Both okay. are not too common. I think there's a question out there, yep. Yes. So which takes precedence, inline embedded or external? Great CSS? question. Yeah, we'll go over, there's like a not complicated formula, but there's like a formula to kind of just mentally understand how it's done. But it goes from most local to most um, foreign, I guess. So in this case, this is the most local to this paragraph. So this gets precedence and then embedded gets precedence and then external gets precedence. Um, but that is not the full story. So um, the, when I, yeah, great question. We'll, we'll get to how the presence kind of works. There, there's an ordering to it also, as in when you define the styles um, can kind of impact it. Okay, let's get back to your example. So external style sheet, I think that's the last one I need to show. So I created the style sheet. I called it style.css. I put it inside of a folder called styles, just because for my organizational sake, you don't have to, you could keep it on the same root level. You could put it in another folder named something else. It doesn't have does not have to be named styles. But in this case, I named it styles and my CSS happens to be named style.css. Again, these are all naming options. The only important part is that I have a .css in there. Let's say I want to use the styles in this document. I need to link it to my um, HTML document here. And the way you do that is via the link tag. So I'm going to insert it in my head section. Again, this must go in your head section. I'm going to link. And then relationship is REL. So this is an attribute. I'm going to say it's a style sheet. Style sheet. I'll always forget the full syntax. So relationship, style sheet, style sheet. And then you have an href, which is, you know, we've seen that in the anchor tag, but href is used here also. And then you want to point it to your CSS file. So in this case, I need to locate my CSS file. So I'm going to do href equals, and then I have my styles folder. So notice VS code is quite helpful. It knows I have a styles folder. Inside that I have style.css, all right? And then I need to close this. Actually, I don't think link tags need to be closed. I'm not sure it's gonna cause an issue. Notice I don't have a closing slash here. Um, I don't think it's gonna be a problem if I do close it, but I'm not 100% sure on that. So let's uh, actually find out together. Um, so I have this link, I'm telling it, it's a style sheet that I'm pointing to here. I'm going to save this, right? So I saved it, uh, Command S. Let's go back to my web page and refresh. Notice I got more styles here. I got everything got centered, and then I got this kind of awkward uh, purplish, light blue color that's that's used for pretty much everything on my page except those paragraphs. Notice my paragraphs are still red and green like I had said before, and this comes down to how the precedence of the CSS. Um, styles kind of takes place. Okay, so that was an example of the three ways you can use styles. Again, inline, rarely used, internal or embedded, um, also pretty rare. External is going to be your predominant way you see styles um, used. It's just better organizationally and also just, um, you know, conceptually, it's better to have a style sheet that can be used by multiple pages. Oh, then you would, otherwise, you had to copy, you know, like embedded styles between pages. Yeah, it's hard to manage. Again, it goes back to uh, the dry principle. Again, DRY, don't repeat yourself. 
usually you don't want to have the same style kind of mirrored across different pages because if you need to change one well then lo and behold you're going to go through all the other pages and change them i think you guys get the idea though all right let's talk about selector types again a lot of a lot of terminology coming your way um, css definitely has a lot to it so um, i'm going to mention that off offhand um, you get different types of selectors universal uses the asterisk or the star character this basically means it's going to apply to every single element in your HTML document that can take that property. So in this case, if I use star, every element here, my, my H1 elements, my um, paragraphs, even my HR, if it wants to take that attribute, um, can take it or that property. Lists, whatever. Whatever I have here, this star will target all of them. So anything I put inside of these uh, curly brackets, that style potentially will apply to everything on my page. Okay. Usually, you're not going to do that unless you have a specific reason that you want everything to take the same property. Um, you can do it by type or by tag. So in this case, if I have a P here, this means every um, paragraph element will take the styles that I specify in where the dot, dot, dot is. Um, but you can also get more granularity or more different ways to select items. There's also by class and by ID. So this is something we probably should have covered in our HTML sec segment, but you can give a class name or multiple classes to a particular element. And you can also give an ID to an element. And these are just attributes that exist on pretty much every tag. So if I wanted to quickly show that, let's create, a, create some examples here. So for this unordered list, I'm gonna give it an ID. To do that, I just type in the ID um, attribute and I give it some name. I could just say uh, tennis, Majors. Um, usually for your IDs, you want to have it as one word. So you don't want spaces here. You can use underscores or dashes. Um, I think dashes are pretty common. So I'm going to use that. So I'm going to call this tennis majors. What this is basically doing is taking this unordered list and giving it a unique identifier. And unique, I, I could say, is not guaranteed, as in theoretically, but you should never, never say never, but you should almost never do this in practice. You should never give the same ID to any other element. Again, ID stands for identifier, so identifier should be unique. So in this case, I wouldn't want to have a div that's also named tennis majors if I already use that somewhere. So that's something you have to manage. Um, it's not regulated by you know, the HTML document or your browser. Like It's not going to really care if you have multiple items named the same ID. There might be some fringe use cases where you do want the same ID. So again, I'm not going to say never do that. But for the most part, always give unique IDs to any element that you're specifying ID for. You don't have to specify an ID. Um, usually you will do that for JavaScript purposes or CSS purposes. What this ID lets me do is target this specific unordered element. Like let's say I had multiple unordered elements. Let me just slide another one in here. Um, I don't know what this one's gonna be, but I'm just gonna say donuts. All right, this will be some lists. Um, nothing too exciting right now. But this is a separate unordered list. So if I create a selector for unordered list, this will apply to all unordered lists. Let's say I, oh, I want to do something special for this one. Well, then I can sele select it by ID. So select it by ID, I use the hash hashtag symbol and then the, the ID of that element that I'm trying to target. So in this case, I do hashtag tennis, tennis dash majors, and that would only target that individual element. It would not impact anything else on my page. You can also specify classes. So classes is something that will be shared potentially by multiple elements. So to do that example, let's do let's do it for this list. So I can do class equals cool list. And then if I want to reuse that class, so again, classes are similar to what we talked about um, in Python OOP um, a couple of weeks ago. But this is basically reusability. So let's say I want to apply that to this ordered list is a cool list. And also this unordered list is a type of cool list. So now that I have this class, I can specify something particular to anything that is using that type of class. So in that case, I'd use a dot and a class name. So in that case, the class name is cool dash list. Now I specify styles that apply to everything that's, that's using that class. So distinction here, class classes should and can and should be reused um, to kind of share 
some styling across different elements. They don't have to be the same type of elements. Like notice I did it on a unordered list and an ordered list. They both have the same class. You can even use like a paragraph can use a class that's also being used by a list. Like again, there's no restriction there. ID on the other hand should be unique and that should only target one specific element. You can also target something by attribute. So if something has an attribute set, you use square brackets. Anything that has an attribute will, will uh, have that style applied to it. Okay, so let's actually try to see some examples because that's always better than seeing some boring slides. So I'm gonna try to do one of each of these and then let's see how our, my web page is impacted. And go back to my editor and go to my style.css. Let's try adding some more styling. So we're gonna create a universal selector. Let's say in this case, I want, let's say I wanna change my font, right? That's a common thing to kind of want to change across your web page. So I can specify a font family and then VS Code kind of has a pre populated list, makes it easier for me to use. Let's use I like Trey Boucher. That's a cool font. So I just click that. Um, so my font family is going to be this specific font. Let's say my default font size, I want to be a bit larger. So let's do, I could say large or I could specify a specific font. So let's do 18 pixels. I'm not sure if that'd be too big or not. All right. So if I do this, again, this is going to apply to every element out there. Um, for the most part, I could just use body here because body is the actual visible content, but universal selector can be used. Um, so let me save that and refresh my page. There we go. Notice my font change. This is trebuchet, not whatever the default font was for the browser. Uh, my font size also got a bit larger, if you noticed. Um, notice my headers now. My headers are all the same size. Why did that happen? Well, because every single element is now using the same exact size. All right, so usually you don't want to do that because I probably want my headers to be different, you know, different sizes. So yeah, universal selector, probably not going to use that often, but if you need to do something to everything on your page, go for it. Um, body, we kind of saw an example of this. So this is a, a type selector or a tag selector. So it's going to select the body tag. If I wanted to add like a paragraph tag, um, I could do, to text align. Let's make our paragraphs align to the left. Now, there's some conflict here. Notice that I'm saying everything in my body should have an alignment of center, but I'm also saying every paragraph should have an alignment of left. So there's some conflict here, and there is a way that is re resolved, and we're going to get into that. But if I save this, let's see what happens. Notice that my paragraphs are now left aligned, but everything else is still center aligned. Okay, well, we will definitely get into how the presence takes in place. So if there's questions, I'm gonna kind of um, hold off on answering those right now. Uh, we can do by attribute. So let's see if we have an attribute. Um, let's say, you know, this has a height. So my image has a height attribute. I can target anything with a height by doing height. And let's just say, let's change the height of it, I guess. Height can be 300, or let's say 400 to elongate it. All right, so anything that has a height attribute set, it's going to specify the height to 400. Or I can even change the width here. Like this doesn't have to be specific to height here. It's just saying anything that has a height attribute, set some style here. So in this case, I want to change the width of anything that has a height attribute set. Again, not really sensi sensible, but um, notice my tennis ball got a little more elongated. That's because I had a height attribute set on this particular um, uh, element. If I took away that height, so let's take away this height momentarily. Notice my width right now is 200. If you remember originally, my like the original image, I believe it was like 800 pixels. So now that I don't have a height specified, this selector will not target that element. There's no height attribute set anymore. So if I refresh this, I would expect a really, really tall image because the default height of the image was like 800 pixels and the width is still going to be 200 because I've specified the width right here. All right, so if I'm correct, uh, okay, that actually did not work. Why well, do that? Because you're right. not specifying a height anymore? Yeah, but I would expect the height. So if I take away the width, there's going to be a giant tennis ball now. Right, so this is the original size of it. So I'm not sure why width constrains both the height and 
width, but maybe that's something I need to clean up on. So maybe the width kind of auto scales the height also. I'm not sure, so I'm gonna kind of bounce over that. Um, that's another research topic, I guess, of images. But anyway, you can, the main point was you can target something by an attribute that's set also. Okay, so those are ways, those are called selectors. You can do a universal by type. So that's where you have a tag by class. But you, you create any class name you want. Likewise, for element, element, you create any element name you want and target those appropriately. All right, let's move on. Um, these are other selectors. I'm not gonna get too into this. I think Tom's probably gonna cover this more in detail tomorrow. So today is just a basic CSS introduction, but you, there are more advanced ways to select items. Um, one example is like div first child, as you might guess, this will actually select the first child element or the first nested element within a div um, that exists. So any div that exists out there, the first nested element will get that style. All right, you could also do something like after. There's a few, you know, pseudo class names and pseudo element names. Again, I'm not going to go too too much into detail on this. Um, Tom will likely go over it tomorrow, or you guys can research it um, just to know how to get more granular selectors out there. Okay, well, let's talk about grouping selector types. So we talked about you can have selectors. You can also chain them together. So multiple elements. So in this case, let's say I want something that happens to every paragraph h1 and h2. Well, that's simple enough. You just separate those by commas. So in this case, this the styles that provide in this dot 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 area here will apply to all H1s, H2s, and paragraphs. So it's just a comma separated list, and you can kind of just chunk everything together. So you don't need to create separate blocks if it's going to be the same style. You can also combine items like by tag and by class. So if I have something like p dot some class, where some class is the name of my class, this will say only target paragraphs that have the specific class that's specified here, All right? So if I go back to my code or to my HTML file, let's say this paragraph over here, I give it a class. So let's say class equals, um, I don't know, orange fonts, All right? So I created a class here. I could target that in my selector here. So I'll do dot, you always do a dot for your classes, orange fonts. And this will use the color, let's just say orange. Let's do, yeah, let's do orange. All right, so this is saying anything with the class name of orange font is going to use a uh, color of orange. So I'm gonna save that. Shouldn't be too surprising that this paragraph should no longer be red. Um, actually, that's not true. This will still be red because I have a inline or an embedded style. So let me get rid of this quickly. Now that this is gone, my style sheet will get so notice this is orange now. And kind of hard to read, definitely ugly colors. So my color scheme is not anything to envy. Um, okay, let's kind of proceed. Also, you can combine tag and attributes. So you can do you know any paragraph that has an align attribute set, specify styles. Again, many possibilities. So if you have something that's chain like p dot some class dot other class, this is specifically gonna look for a paragraph that has both of these classes set. So uh, one thing I probably didn't mention, uh, one element can have multiple classes attributed to it. So this paragraph that I created here, I have orange font as one of the classes. I could have another class also. I could say um, cool fonts. I could say um, right aligned paragraph. Again, I could create as many classes as I want. These are just names. These names allow me to create style specifically for those classes. So let's say I want to use cool font with this paragraph and also you know, this list down here. That's the whole point of creating these classes for the reusability of those styles. Same general principle as using classes in Python is to give you that reusability so you're not kind of reinventing the wheel or repeating yourself for something that should be shared. Okay, so in this case, I have three classes specified to this um, paragraph. I don't have to give a definition of cool font or right align font. Like if I ran this, there's nothing that's going to break and say, hey, I don't know what cool font is. That's totally fine. These don't have to be defined. That just gives you kind of a placeholder. If you want to give a definition to it, you can now because you specify that, hey, this is a cool font, um, an element that uses a cool font class or uses orange font or whatever you want to name it. You guys with me? What questions do you guys have? Again, you can, this, these selectors 
can I just give you as much granularity as you need? So again, if you want something super specific as in a particular paragraph that has two specific classes set, then you could do that. If you want it really general or you just want all paragraphs to do something, you could do that too. So CSS gives you as much granularity as you need or don't need to achieve what style you're trying to apply. I have a question, Anker. Yep, of course. Um, because CSS is the way that is, is there a framework that you recommend? Like I've seen plenty of frameworks and they always say our framework is, is the best. I'm like, mm, okay. Yep. Uh, in terms of frameworks, this is basically going back to the whole idea of reusability. Um, there's, you know, people or corporations have created um, predefined styles. So bootstrap is something you'll hear of often. I'm assuming Tom's going to go over it tomorrow, so I'm not going to dive into it, but bootstrap just has predefined styles for you. That kind of just makes it easier to develop if you want to use their styling components. So um, there's Bootstrap. There's also uh, Material UI. There's a whole list of them. So yes, there are kind of pre-created styles for you, so that you don't have to like you know I don't have to create something like this. There might be just a pre pre-created style for this already. But yes, uh, I don't I don't have one recommended or other. We use Bootstrap in our curriculum, so that's one I'll focus on if you're looking to kind of get a head start. But again, Tom will go over Bootstrap tomorrow. So I'm gonna kind of table that for now, but uh, good to be aware of those. Okay, so grouping select types, again, idea is here you group um, the selector types that we listed here in uh, combination so that you achieve the granularity that you need. All right, more technical stuff. Selector specificity, uh, kind of an odd word to say, but this is um, kind of answering the question of what gets precedence when you have multiple styles that are conflicting. So if I go back to the example that I set up here, notice I had, where's my paragraph? So, uh, this one. I had an inline style here. This is specifying a color for this paragraph. However, I am including an external style sheet that also is specifying a color for elements here. Let's say I want to make that more specific to this paragraph. Let's add a color here. Let's just say, let's use a hex color. Let's just do 00 CC PD. So that's gonna be like a tealish color. Maybe make that a little darker so it's easier on the eyes. 99 PD. Okay, so it's gonna be like a teal light blue color for all paragraphs. I'm saying every paragraph should be that blue color. But in here, I have another conflicting style that says, hey, this paragraph should be green. The question is, who gets precedence? That's where we get this not so complicated formula. So the way we kind of figure it out is by the type of selector that's being used and also, I guess, if it's inline or not. So type selectors have the least um, specificity and they get the least precedence. So in this case, if I say a paragraph, like I did in my style sheet here, sorry for bouncing around so much, this is a type selector. I'm selecting all paragraphs. This is the least specific type of selector. So this will get the least precedence um, out there. The way I can make that more specific is if I do something like um, orange font, this is gonna say any paragraph with an orange font class, give it some styling. So in this case, I could you know, do text line. No, I don't wanna confuse you guys there. Let's do color orange. I don't actually need to do this because that's what this class is doing. But let's take this out. So notice I'm not going to define this orange font class, um, but I'm going to do it here. All right, so now this is saying any paragraph that has an or orange font class specified should get a, a color of orange. In this case, this selector is more specific than this one because this is spe specifying I want only paragraphs with orange fonts as a class. So that's where we go to the second level where we have a class selector. When you're using a class selector, that gives you a weight of 10. And these are arbitrary numbers, so I wanna make that clear. This is not saying that a class selector is 10 times a type selector. This is just saying that a class selector is another magnitude of specificity over type selector. Okay, so I just wanna make that clear. This is not actual, these are not actual numbers you should be using. It's just the magnitude that you're trying to encompass with these numbers. Then you have ID selectors. ID selectors are more specific than class selectors. Because again, each, an element that has an ID should be unique, as in no ID should be more used more than once. So if I had something like, uh, let's continue our paragraph, paragraph, 
paragraph example, if I do paragraph um, hashtag um, my paragraph, this is more specific than this because only one one element should be targeted by this. So if I did color equals, I'm running out of default colors to use. Uh, let's go with PD zero zero. I don't know three three. This is some reddish color. All right, we'll make that a dark pinkish color. So anything that has my ID, any paragraph that has my paragraph as an ID, that'll be more specific than orange font. So to highlight that, let's actually give this class both an ID and a class, which is totally allowed and often the case. In this case, it'll be ID. Um, what was it? My paragraph. All right. So one thing when you're specifying IDs, you don't include the hashtag in the name. You only use that for selectors. So my paragraph is my ID. I use hashtag to select it. Okay. So we have conflicting styles here now, right? We have an ID of my paragraph. And this is a paragraph uh, tag. We also have a class that uses orange font for this paragraph. So at this point, we have three different selectors that could be targeting this. We have the general case, the uh, uh, type selector of paragraph. We also have a, a paragraph with a class selector and a paragraph with a ID selector. This is the most specific because if we go back to our, our magic formula, ID selectors get a weighting of 100. So basically this is a different order of magnitude than class selector. And just to reiterate my point, just make sure I have not confused you guys or I'm lying to you. This does not mean that if you have 11 different classes specified, that gets more weight than ID selector. That, that's not what's going on. So what I mean by that is you have as many classes chained on here. So I could say class one, class, hopefully you guys get it. Like you can specify as many classes as you want. So this is going to match a paragraph with all these classes selected. If I have 11 classes here, that does not mean it holds more weight than one ID. An ID still gets present any, over any number of classes. So again, this number is just a magnitude, not an actual number. So ID selectors get more precedence or more specificity than classes. So they get precedence during style selection. Finally, inline styles always trump anything else that's kind of coming from above. So if you have anything that's inline, that style is going to be applied. Um, no questions asked. All right, let me pause there. Uh, what questions are brewing in your head right now? Okay, uh, hopefully that made sense. Again, just understand there is specificity. The more specific you are with something, the greater precedence or the weight it has in terms of deciding what style actually gets implemented. So since I applied this, I would expect my paragraph to become this dark pink color. So if I save this and refresh it, yep, notice we get this dark pink. It might be kind of hard to see, it might kind of look black, but it is a dark pink color. Let's actually make that pop a little bit more. Okay, so again, it should be a pink color. There we go. Okay, this page is definitely not still looking kind of ugly, but got some coloring in there, some font usage, so some improvement maybe. Um, all right, so just going to that example again, um, specificity. If you use a class selector, that's equal 10 in their forma, but just 10 meaning uh, for uh, magnitude purposes. So if you do a, a type selector with a class, you add the numbers. So in this case, a type selector gets a value of one, class selector gets a value of 10. So in this case, the specificity um, value of this selector would be 11. So we get precedence over just some class selector. But as we saw, we could do like a type and ID that would have a weighting of 101 because you get 100 from the ID and one from the type. So in this case, if I had three of these um, kind of targeting the same element, my most specific one will get used. But then the question is, what if there's a tie? As in, what if you have two equal weighted selectors, um, what happens then? So a great example of that is, let's go back to our embedded style. Where was that? Um, I had this embedded style up here. I'm gonna uncomment it over here. So the color here, I'm gonna change it up just to get more variation. Let's get a green, a bright green going. All right, so this is a bright, bright green. Probably gonna burn our eyes. Let's dim that down a bit. Okay, so we have this brightish green. 
here. This is an embedded style. And I'm going to take away these classes just to make sure we're not getting too confused. So I'm taking away my ID and classes for this paragraph. I'm just going to take away this embedded style. All right, so these paragraphs have no specific style or classes or ID specified to them. So we only have this style here. And where'd it go? This style here is all I care about. Getting rid of these classes. All right, so we have a paragraph selector here that's saying, hey, I want my paragraphs to be this shade of blue. But we also have an embedded style that says, hey, I want all my paragraphs to be this shade of green. Who's going to win out? And the answer to that, first you, you look at specificity. Well, in this case, both are the same specificity. Both are type selectors. So the both are value of one. So in that case, we have a tie. Both are exactly specific in the same manner. So the question is, who gets a tie? Whoever's defined last in the order. So this is the idea of cascading style sheets. When we think about cascading, it's like a waterfall. It's just falling on top of one another. So you might have multiple style sheets or multiple you know, styles. Whichever is at the bottom or you know, the most recent defined um, style gets the precedence in that case. So the tie goes to the last defined item. And to highlight that, we're going to go here. In this case, I have two styles coming in. I have my style sheet, which is defined on line six. That's where I'm linking it. And I also have a style on line seven, eight, and nine for the paragraph. In this case, my paragraph is coming after any of the styles coming in here. So this is the last or most recent defined style. That will get precedence in case of a tie. So if I save this and refresh my page, these paragraphs both should become bright green. Um, and that is correct because my paragraph style for the green came after whatever my external style sheet was specified. If I swap the ordering here, which I'm going to do right now, so I'm taking my style sheet link and putting it after that embedded style. So notice that my style sheet comes on line nine, which is after this style. Now, whatever is in my style sheet will get precedence if there's a tie. So if I go back here, notice I have a paragraph, all my paragraphs should be blue and should be left line. So I'm going to save that, refresh this, and notice they became this shade of blue. Are these colors rendering? I'm not sure how vivid my screen might be. Yep. All right. So, yep, it's blue. Whole reason is because they tied. We had a paragraph selector here, paragraph selector here. They're both equally specific. Therefore, whichever order they come in, the last ordering wins out. Okay. So that, that talks about specificity. Who gets precedence? If there's a tie, it's whoever comes last in the ordering. When's that tie? The precedence. Okay, I know we're hitting lunch time, so I'm gonna try to power through this. Uh, I don't think we have too much to go. Yep, two more slides to go through. Um, selector combinators. Again, a lot of technical stuff here. Um, I'm not gonna go through, I'll go probably over one example, but you can, again, use your combinators to kind of specify particular elements on your page. So the syntax are shown here. If you have um, an, uh, a type, in this case, I have a div, and then a space, oops, sorry. I have a space here, so that, that, that's meaningful, and then a paragraph. This is saying all descendants. So basically any paragraph that is under a, a div tag. My current page has no such instances of that because I do have paragraphs here, right? I have a paragraph tag here and a paragraph tag here, but they are not nested under a div. So in this case, if I had a selector like um, div space p, these paragraphs will be unaffected. Well, let's actually create an example just for fun. Um, I have some divs here that I created before. Let's create a paragraph here. Paragraph, uh, this is a paragraph nested under a div. Okay, so this paragraph is a child of a div versus these paragraphs above are not under any div tag. So if I save this and let's give it some definition. So again, I'm gonna use that new syntax So div and then a P, which means any paragraph that's a descendant or basically nested at any level under my div, let's say that gets another color. Color will be, I don't know, I'm running out of color selections. Let's go with AA, AA. Let's make it a nice shade of gray. Okay, so we have gray um, for that paragraph. Hopefully that renders well enough. So if I refresh this, notice that this paragraph is gray. It is not blue. 
uh, put those both on the same screen. Um, these paragraphs up here are still blue. This is gray because I've said any paragraph under divs get that gray color. All right, so again, this is a little more complicated. Don't expect you guys to memorize it. Just understand you have the, have the capability to kind of target elements more specifically if you need to. So um, if you do a space, that means all descendants. At any level under my div, if I find a paragraph, it's going to use that style. If I want it to be only my children, so let's say I have a div, div uh, element and I want only the direct children, as in not grandchildren or any further descendant, only children, I'd use this angle bracket to say immediate children. So any paragraph that's immediately under um, the div, as in the next level down. You could also use siblings. So the squiggle, squiggle or tilde character means next siblings. So instead of being nested within it, it's just next on the same level. So in this case, div squiggle p would be an example of, I always get to the wrong file. If I have a div here, this would be a sibling of that div. This is a sibling to the nested div, right? Because this is one div or div on line fix one. This is a sibling. It is on the same level that has a, a same parent. So the, this parent paragraph is not nested in this div. So um, again, that's what the tilde will do. We can also do plus. That means adjacent sibling. So immediately right after, but not any sibling. It's just the one sibling right after this div, as opposed to the tilde means any sibling after this div. Again, uh, a little more complicated, um, more specific use cases. I'm not going to go through examples of these, but just know that you have the capability of specifying these particular um, elements should you need to do so. You can also use not, which just means, hey, I don't want uh, paragraphs included in the style. So this means any element that is not a paragraph, apply a style to it at, um, based on the styling set. All right, last thing. Um, We'll try to get through this, but it's important to know. Um, this is the box model. Um, looks simple enough, but it's important to know. Elements have four, I guess, different boxes to them. You have their content. You might have a padding. You might have a border. You might have a margin. These are important to know when you're dealing with styling and trying to lay stuff out and just you know make your pages look nice. This model, as simple as it looks, it's it's not as easy to kind of understand when you're having multiple elements interacting with one another. Basically anything within the border, so the border padding and content is within the element that you're dealing with. The margin is excluded from your element. So if you're trying to size up your element, it's gonna be your border, everything inward. Your margin is extra space outside of your element. Um, content is your main content. Padding is just space between your border and your content, should you want it. Right, but that's still in, inside your element. Um, and then margin is spacing that you want between elements. So let's quickly code this up so we can see these levels. And then that should hopefully give us a good idea of our box model. So I'm gonna create a box model for, let's do it for, um, let's just do it for a paragraph. So this paragraph here, I'm gonna create a box model for it just to highlight different parts of a paragraph or an element that so I'm gonna use the paragraph tag. So let's find that. Paragraph tag, um, it's right here. I'm gonna say that has a class of box. Again, I can name this whatever I want, box. I'm just calling it box because that's what I'm trying to highlight. So here I'm gonna create uh, a box class selector. So remember that dot for classes. And let's uh, give it some items. So I'm gonna give it uh, padding. And let's say I want padding to be four pixels all around. Let's give it a margin also. And let's give that margin, let's say 16 pixels, just to be a little large. And then I'm gonna need some coloring here. So I'm gonna nest this in a div. And the reason I'm nesting it in a div so I can see that margin space. So this div would be class uh, box parent. And then I'm gonna say box parent should have a color, background color, did not use that before. Background color of this box will be, um, I think it's something light, let's make it plum. And then my box will also have background color. Let's make that, I don't know how this is all gonna look. 
like a yellow. It's gonna burn our eyes, but let's go with it, All right? So our paragraph is class box. It's gonna have a background color of this and ideally should have, uh, let's have a foreground color. That makes sense. So I guess that works. All right, so we have all these colors set. We also have margin and padding. The whole point of this is so we can see um, the items and we also need a border. So border, um, I always forget the order of the borders. Order. It'd be color, pixel, and then if you want it like solid or dotted. Gotcha, yeah, I always, I always forget the specifics, so. In your second box, you have to add parent because you just called them both boxes. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Um, box parent, so I named it. Yep. Okay, thanks. Uh, border, what was it? It was color, thickness, and then style? Yeah, color, then pixel, and then if you want it solid, dotted, or dashed. Thank you. I always forget the ordering there. So again, references are, are good. So let's make this black so it's easier to see. All right, so I have all these colors set. Let's actually see what happens and then talk about them. So if I go here, refresh. All right, so we got some weird stuff going on here. Notice that the background of my paragraph is yellow. That is the entire element. It's using that yellow because I specified I want yellow as the background color for that for that element. Um, I'm going to increase my padding here just to get a little more space. All right, so padding is working internal. So my border is black. This thick black line is the border for my element. The space between my paragraph and that border, that is the padding that's going on there. Okay. Um, and then this pink color kind of creeping in here, that is the margin that's set. In this case, it's not being applied vertically because it's being eaten by the space here. So paragraphs kind of get confusing, but uh, yeah, so this is the margin. So I created some margin from the left and right side. Uh, usually it should apply to all sides, but if I want to make that gigantic, like 60 pixels, notice there's 60 pixels on this side and on the right side. That's margin. It's outside of my element, but it's kind of spacing it between any other elements that might be in there. So this would be useful if we had inline elements, but I did not cover that. So um, again, the box, box model is kind of going here. What I have highlighted here, this is the content, the space between the border and the content, that's the padding. And then the border is that black thick line. And then the pink stuff is the margin. It'd be nice if I could code this up for a better example. So let's quickly try that. So I'm going to use spans. Spans again are inline elements. So let's span this. Can I span these paragraphs on the same level? Is the question. I'm not sure if this will work, but let's give it a try. Okay, I'm going to reuse that box and box class. Okay, and let's say this is a new paragraph. I'm not sure if this is going to work as I expected to. Save that and refresh. Okay, so that didn't span it out, but as you can see, the margins here. So this is the margin. I don't think it's a space. Let me get rid of these spaces here. Oh, those were the no break space. I guess it was these spaces. Anyway, um, now that we have two paragraphs, they're divided by 60. Um, pixels. They actually overlap, so this is more technical, but these don't get added. As in, I don't get 60 pixels from this paragraph and 60 pixels from this paragraph for the margin. They overlap and take the, I guess, the largest um, difference. So in this case, both these paragraphs are using class box. They have a margin of 60, which is the pink area. Um, the padding, again, is internal, so if I want to blow that up and make it look crazy, I totally can. So let's make that 20. We're just going to increase the yellow area because that's inside of our element. So I refresh, notice we got more space now. Okay, so box model might take a little bit of use, uh, a little practice to get used to, but just understand there's four different things you gotta factor in. Padding and margin are just for white space. Border, again, it's pretty straightforward to have like an actual border around your elements. Content is your default. Like you're always gonna have content, um, content space. It's gonna be auto-sized to what your content should be. In the paragraph sense, like it'll fit it to the text. But if you want extra space, you add padding. If you want buffer space between other elements, you add margin. And that is the box model. All right, let's summarize. So key takeaways, um, again, a lot thrown at you. A lot of it's gonna be 
go read references. So likewise for CSS, like we did for HTML, there is a good reference that we have linked, but you can find probably dozens of other references. So where is it? Somewhere on here. All right, I lied, it's not on here. That is our bad, I'll add it on there, but there's CSS reference io yep i assume it's made by the same people that made html reference io but same thing list all of the properties you have and there are a ton so have fun reading if you want to look at them all but um you know they give you some item uh description of what layout styles are used into with and kind of what categories they fall into so you can set background types so we talked about background image i have three who asked that it might have been Tim or someone asked background image. So you can set a background image. So let's actually yep. do that. Um, since I said I would. So let's go to our body. I'm going to do background image. Uh, let's just use the same tennis ball image because I have no other images on hand right now. Actually, that's fine. Image. So say tennis court wallpaper. A little thematic. Okay. Uh, images. Let's find a nice one. All right, this one looks good enough. It's going to be stretched because it's not big enough. That's what this one, full HD. All right, so I'm going to just copy the URL and then go here. That is a gigantic URL. Holy gosh. All right, maybe that's why you don't copy from Google. All right, um, that took up like a good 100 lines of my CSS. So let's uh, apply that. Okay. All right, let's try a different image. Background image. Uh, let's actually use a reference since we have it up here. Uh, background image, click on it. Let's see how we use it. So you do none. Oh, you got to use URL. That's what I forgot. So this is I'm specifying a URL. You also do a gradient, as you see below. If you want to use nice gradients, I love using gradients, but let's use a URL. So I have a URL. And then here, I need to get that gross thing back. Maybe I can get a nicer image here. Okay, that works. Much nicer URL here. Don't know if I need that in quotes or not. Let's find out. Yeah, it's in quotes. Okay. Alex, you seem to know your CSS there. Yeah, I struggled with it. So. All right, there we go. We got a nice, nice and relative quote, but we got a background image. So that's cool. We got this weird tennis ball for my image. Uh, my fonts are no longer readable because I picked four color choices, but they're still there. I promise you. But yep, you can do a lot with CSS. Um, again, half of it, half the is going to be reading documentation and figuring out how to, how to do what you want to do. Again, there's a lot you can do with it. Sometimes it can be frustrating to figure out how to do exactly what you want to do, but usually it's going to be possible. Um, with all these properties that are, are listed here. Okay, so uh, CSS reference at IO. Um, I'll add a link to that to our page since it seems like we should have that. But again, you find your own references. There's a ton of CSS references out there. Um, okay, I think that kind of wraps, wraps, wraps us up. So key takeaways, just know the basic structure of HTML document, know the common HTML elements. So to recap those, just know headers, paragraphs, uh, anchor tag, image tag, lists, um, what else? We had like horizontal rules, break lines, also divs and spans. Just understand those are probably the most common you'll see. Um, likewise, know the basic structure of CSS documents. So again, just knowing those selectors by quickly can go back. Again, just know your basic look should be selector, then property, and then value. So that's how your style should be defined. Um, know how it's use CSS selectors. So the ones we talked about were like tag selectors, class selectors, ID selectors, or even by attribute. Just know there's different granularities you can get. Um, also understand CSS specificities. So again, a lot of complicated topics here, but specificity, spe specificities is the idea of, hey, if you have multiple styles that kind of target the same element, who gets precedence or which style gets precedence? And again, the most specific one usually wins out. If you have a tie, the most recent one listed will win out. So again, you might have cases where you're like, hey, I have this style targeting this element, but I'm not seeing the colors. Like, well, likely the case is that something else is overwriting it because it's more specific or um, it's defined after the style that you created. Okay, 
So that was our introduction to HTML and CSS. What questions do you guys have before we go off to lunch? All right, seems like I've left you guys speechless. So either my presentation was that amazing or that confusing. Uh, we'll, we'll say maybe somewhere in between. But um, yeah, again, more practice. Um, if you never coded an HTML page before, um, today's goal is just to have a basic HTML page you create and messing around with basic CSS um, items. So let's actually stop the recording.